Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to all the Christians, the Muslims, the Jews, the atheists, the agnostics, the Hindus, the Buddhists, and yes, even you few branch Davidians who are scrambling around somewhere. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood, and with me now is a former cold case detective and a former atheist, Jay Warner Wallace. Uh, Jay, how you doing? Doing good. I always love your intros, man. I swear. You know, I was just talking to you about how, how much of a fan my wife is of your stuff, and this is why. Okay, uh, so just so you know. I, mu I must say, I don't blame her. <laughs> <laughs> that was dumb. That was dumb. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going to forgive you for that. All right. Well, uh, oh, yeah. See, everyone's reminding me. Gen Z Apologetics said Ramadan is here. Uh, That's right. Yep. And uh, someone pointed out, Nate pointed out that uh, Vocab's video is going live right now at the same time we're starting. So, uh, sorry, Vocab. Oh, no. Too bad. Change your time next time. Change all your videos to 7 o'clock before, before I go live. Or, uh, or You're basically the, the, the video killer, aren't you, David? Yep, I mean, I nobody else can think about going live. Nope. Let me see first what David's it's doing. A bad idea. And then I'll decide idea. if I want to go live. Yeah, <laughs> I get you. It's a bad idea. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, Jay, we do have uh, we do have a lot of viewers from all different parts of the world, so Africa, Asia, everywhere, and so um, uh, for people who in in places where um, I don't know is cold is a cold case detective is that a thing everywhere like like in you know in Thailand do mm -hmm. they have cold case detectives people going through you know cases from like 30, 40, 50 years ago and trying to solve them I don't know that I don't know if that's a thing yeah. I bet they probably do. I mean, the thing about it is, you know, as you know, cold cases are just murders. Mm -hmm. And because murders are seen as such a big deal, uh, there's no statute of limitations for those. So uh, while well, uh, robberies and, 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 you know, burglaries, they all, those all close because the statute says they must close. Uh, homicides don't. So I'll bet you in other places where they probably feel the same way about murders. Mm -hmm. They would probably leave them open, and that's all you know, I'm working. And I'll tell you something: you and I both know that at some point, when we're making a case for Christianity or for God's existence, the question becomes, well, well who are you? Yeah. Okay, so why should why should I care what a cold case detective thinks? That's what kind of skill set could that? How could that possibly address some of the issues related to science or whatever? And how I usually address that is that if you think about it. I call experts into criminal trials all the time, and juries listen to those people. And and the problem, of course, is that the I'll call an expert for our side, and the defense team will hire a better expert, and they'll call that expert for their side. And looking at the exact same piece of evidence, these two scientific experts will disagree and argue that they should their interpretation should rule the day. And we tell jurors, hey, just use your common sense. You're a big boy. You can actually figure out which of these two might possess a bias or whatever. And and so it turns out that just regular folks have the ability to read the offerings of scientists and make a decision about whether or not that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. So I think in the end, it does come down to just regular folks like you. Like like well, I, I consider myself to be just a regular you know, guy. Now, I've got a master's degree in theology, but it doesn't really prepare me. Mm -hmm. You know, my son's a biochemist, okay, and now he's an anesthesiologist. So if I'm going to default to something that has to do with genetics or, or how body chemistry works, I'm going to call David mm -hmm. because he's going to be able to tell me that I'm full of it, right, you know? That I'm I'm completely wrong. Mm -hmm. So so I I do try to consult the, the experts, but what we do is we try to assemble forensically what happened in the past, and that's kind of what we're doing with Christianity. We're trying to figure out can we assemble a case based on what forensic science is available to us, and there's not a lot, and just based on the reliability of eyewitness claims. Can we kind of figure out if that actually happened that thing in the past, whether it's a murder from 40 years ago, whether it's uh, the resurrection from 2000 years ago? Mm -hmm. Now, um, I actually I was writing something in the middle of the night, like two or three in the morning one night. And uh, there was a program on. I forget what it was. It was one of these like 2020 20 or 60 minutes. And it was a, it was a replay because in the middle of the night and uh, they were talking about a cold case. And I turned look and you were on there. You were on the TV. So what do you know? What was yeah, that? What, yeah. Uh, so what? almost all of our cold cases ended up on Dateline hmm. at one okay. point. And that means, that, you have a, you, that means you have this future on TV that lasts about 10 years per episode because they get recycled. Mm -hmm. Dateline's like a crazy recycling thing. So, so yeah, I think we've been on there six times. So there's, there's six cases. And I, I, I worked a lot of cold cases, but those are the ones that were the big ones. And they're interested only because I work in Los Angeles County 
and Universal Studio uh, Universal is right here. And the NBC Universal is right up the, up the road. Mm-hmm. So they're always looking for things that will appear in a Los Angeles County courtroom. Mm-hmm. And my case has always ended up downtown. So that's that's we're close. <laughs> so that's really all it is. So so you guys uh, would you guys would. Uh basically uh notice that there's this murder from 40 years ago it was never right. solved and you basically say let's go ahead and look through this again maybe with some fresh eyes and maybe with some yeah. modern some modern technology we can right. we can solve this murder that was never solved before yeah i'll, I'll give you an example of what this looks like if you don't mind seeing me in my california shorts hang on a second uh, and, and- and, and just 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 so every hey just so, one, sec, one second uh, Jay what? just just so everyone knows I'm a uh, I've got pajamas on okay very good just wanted That's to right. show just want to show we're That's in the right. same ballpark dude it's like 85 degrees here today so it's 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 crazy hot um, okay not crazy hot but it's unusual um, so this is what uh, one of these things looks like uh, on my side so there's a case file about this large that's sitting in our vault mm-hmm. when i start and that's the original case this is from uh, 1979 mm-hmm. so that was the original case well then over the next 11 years i opened this in 2003 we convicted him in 2014 wow. um that this is what we developed right this is just all the follow-up work we do mm-hmm. so in the end you end up with this huge file and you're assessing you know you're assessing eyewitnesses you're trying to figure out can I trust what this guy said, you know, 35 years ago? And sometimes these guys aren't available to us. So it's similar to what we're talking about with the Gospels in the mm-hmm. sense that I have a missing eyewitness. He's dead. And the reporter, the supplemental report writer, was a detective who's also dead. So I can't even ask the report writer, hey, why didn't you ask this question? Or why does this appear to be different than what this witness is saying? Did you ask a follow-up question? Is that really a contradiction? Or is it just that you didn't ask a good follow-up question? Well, I can't ask those kinds of things because the supplemental report writers are are gone. Mm -hmm. So uh, you had to develop a different way of looking at those kinds of cases, and that's what tried to do with all those cold Uh, cases. This is kind of of a side note, but I wanted to get it out there. Mm -hmm. I wanted this on record. Um, years ago, now this is probably I don't know nine nine years ago something like that. One of my most popular videos of all time is a video called "Who Killed Muhammad," and that video actually starts off with uh, me calling the pretending to call the police, saying uh, I need to know who killed Muhammad. Yeah. And uh, I say, don't you guys have like a cold case squad or something, right? And the the reason is almost every Muslim you ever ask, you know, what happened to mm-hmm. Muhammad? How did Muhammad die? They say he got sick one day and you know he died. Um, according to the Muslim sources, Muhammad claimed that he was poisoned, right? Muhammad claimed that he was poisoned and that the poison damaged him for a period of about three years until it if, if, if finally killed him. Now, in the Sunni sources, they say that it was, uh, it was a Jewish woman whose family had been slaughtered by Muslims. Mm-hmm. And so and this is one of the silliest things I've ever read in my life. But Muhammad, Muhammad's followers slaughtered her whole family. And right after they slaughtered her whole family, she comes in and says, Muhammad, I'd like to cook you dinner. And Muhammad says, oh, that's a good idea. Sure, I love, I love dinner, right? And so <laughs> she brings him, so she brings in this, this food. And uh, one of Muhammad's followers was across the table. And he actually says to himself, well, he, is, he said he, he tasted it as soon as he tasted the, the food. Mm. He could tell that it was poison, but he looks across and sees Muhammad eating it. And it's, well, it's like, well, he's a prophet. There's no way he's eating this if it's poisoned. So he keeps eating it. And then all of a sudden they say he turned green and drops dead. Then Muhammad mm. says, Muhammad gets this miraculous revelation. Up, oh, I've been warned. I've been warned that this is poisoned, right? So he suddenly gets this revelation, right? But uh, so he spits his food out that he's got in his mouth. But even years later, they said they could see the the damage that it did inside his mouth. It was some sort mm. of cor- it was something corrosive, and they said they could always see in his mouth the damage that was caused by this poison. So, so Muhammad spends three years in pain with this problem, and then dies from it. But as he's dying, he says. I feel my aorta being severed. I feel my aorta being severed from this poison. Now, why that's relevant is in the Quran, Surah 69, verses 44 to 46, Allah says, if Muhammad were to invent a false revelation, if he were to fabricate a lie against me, I would sever his aorta. 
right? So I basically mm-hmm. say we got a we got a mystery on our hands because Muhammad's saying this woman poisoned him, and she is there are Shias who actually say that that his the family mm-hmm. of Aisha the family of Aisha poisoned him because they wanted to take over. But then you've got Allah, and so I, I kind of uh, I kind of explore the sources to try and get to the bottom of this. Anyway, one day I was sitting down with some I. I'm not sure who, you know, Mark Middleberg, right? Is that your friend? Oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I was sitting down with Mark Middleberg and I was just, I, I, I'm this uh, endless fire hose of awesome ideas. So I said, you know, it'd be awesome to do like a, a like a Dateline special with Jay Warner Wallace, where we do it and we have all Serious. the effects. We do it all the effects, yeah. but it's called Cold Case Muhammad. And so I said that and he goes, oh yeah, you should tell him that. I was like, he's not going to do that. It'd be embarrassing. And, he, and Mark goes, no, I don't know. He might. <laughs> So. Yeah, well, I think actually, I always I, I get asked this question a lot. Did you do the same thing with the uh, Islamic text that you did with the Christian text to decide that Islam was? So I have a class I teach at Biola where I tell the students if they want to take these principles that we teach them in cold case Christianity mm-hmm. and apply them to any other historically grounded theistic system. So it has to be some a system that makes claims about historical events, right? That's what we're testing. And, and, and so a lot of them have done Islam. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, I just, the, my problem is, is that, that you would have to have your head knowledge to be able to start something like this. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, it's, I, I can apply a certain approach, a certain technique that we apply in criminal cases, but I have to first do that notebook full of research, mm-hmm. right? So that's the, that's the, the 11 years of research and I just I feel like wow that's a, that would be like a, a, a probably a two or a three year project for me. I mean probably oh, more than oh, that just oh, to ramp up. I, I think I think you're thinking of it more seriously than I am. I'm no, thinking- no 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 <laughs> I know I know I know. But we could definitely yeah. yeah. So do I have a problem with doing something that's comical on 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 YouTube? Uh, well no we're here right now so I, I suppose I'm, I'm okay with it. Yeah so. yeah. What 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 I'm thinking is that it it would be awesome to take to find like experts in like you know poisons and stuff like that and say okay what yeah. what what was there that would have been available in 7th century arabia that could yeah. have some wow. corro- that could have some corrosive effect on someone's mouth yeah. could do internal damage that you know leads to pain but also allows someone to survive for 3 years or if you ingest more of it can just turn you green and you drop dead from it yeah, and they, right. I, and they might be there might be people who actually know oh yeah you take you take that plant and grind it up and stick it in there and they know that and no no anyway, absolutely and you stuff. have an, you have the testimony of somebody who like you said you have another person who was poisoned that you could actually look at and say okay does that tell us something about the process? Yeah, so that I think it'd be worth doing, sure. All right, now, uh, uh, now, uh, now, now that we got sidetracked by my uh, okay. endless stream oh. of awesome ideas, <laughs> right? Um, you are both a former cold case detective and a former atheist. Which one of those do yep. you do you like better? Well, um, I still have two open cases, and I think that one of them at some point here, real quick, is going to. We just solved uh, the, the two open cases I had when I retired. Um, I knew I'd have to come back to them at some point, and and I. But luckily, uh, we got a DNA hit. The first time I'd ever gotten a DNA hit, on, and solved one of them last about six months ago. So we just finished a case from 1972 that my dad was the I.O. on. Wow. He was the initial investigating officer. So that one's done. And so now I have one that I'd like to return to. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's some movement on that case. I can see us returning to it. So I guess of those two things, I mean, you know, the, 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 I can definitely say I was a, I'm a former atheist. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure I can still say yet oh. I'm a former detective because i still have an open case okay but. so that might you might still be uh you might still be in there for a while all right well uh why don't you yep. give a uh, um now your your testimony is available in book form the uh link to that is in the description box cold case uh christianity and um a couple other links to your website and some other resources and so on in the description box for anyone who wants to check these out uh we are here to talk about the impact of christianity specifically on science and education but before we yep. before we do that just for people who um, are hearing you for the first time why don't you give us the condensed version of how you ended up um, atheist cold case detective to uh, Christian apologist who's oh, okay. still a cold case detective. Well, I have uh, my, my I was raised in a Christian family, and so it's, it's just that Los Angeles back in the 60s and 70s, uh, it was not hard to find pockets of this community. It's so large that uh, are not uh, no believers are in. So I, I didn't actually encounter anybody who invited me to church. Um, and I didn't have uh, necessarily a negative view of Christianity growing up. 
But by the time I got to work as a detective, I did start to develop a very negative view of Christians because the few that I knew did not seem to be equipped to even answer the simplest question. And then uh, we took a lot of people to jail that would tell us that they were Christians while they're sitting in the back of my patrol car on the way, you know, behind the cage on the way to jail. And I'm thinking, okay, that makes sense. So I would, I, I would spend a lot of time mocking the few Christians that I, I met. Um, but, you know, a lot of that was just my own um, perspective as a guy who didn't know any Christians growing up. And, and my wife, though, has, was a much more open um was much more open to the idea of God's existence and that Jesus is somehow part of the picture. Now, now she didn't have a clear idea what that even meant. But when we started having kids, she said, "Okay, well, should we like bring our kids to church? Um, I mean, should we like should we raise them in the church? Should we teach them anything about the possible existence of God?" And I'm like, "No. I mean, I, I, you could if you want. I mean, I'll go if you want me to go. But I, no one did that with me, and I don't." have a desire to do that with my own kids. I mean, I would be a hypocrite to, to pretend like I actually believe it. But I was willing, like my dad, who still very much would be willing to go to church and sees the value of church. My dad sees the value of a Christian worldview in a culture, but he is not, um, I think he's a little softer now to the idea than he was when we were younger, but uh, he's now 80. So so he would, be, he would go to church as a non-believer, no problem. So I, I said, okay, I'll go to church as a non-believer, and I was willing to go. And that, then when I went to this church, it was the first time I was ever sat you know, in an evangelical church. The pastor that, and I'll never forget it, because it stood out to me so so dramatically, he pitched Jesus and said a number of things that I probably will never remember. I'd like to have a copy of the sermon, actually, but I wish I had it. Uh, but he did say that Jesus was the smartest man who ever lived, and that thing stuck with me. So I went out and I got a pew Bible, which is still sitting on my shelf. I wasn't going to invest a lot of money in this. And I started to read through it to see what's so smart about Jesus. And um, that ended up producing a bunch of notes. And then I thought, as I'm reading through the gospel accounts, I'm like starting to see things that bug me. Because if you've ever read eyewitness accounts, um, you will see things that are contradictory, or at least they contradictory. Because there's no two eyewitnesses ever agree on anything. And the way they disagree, the little subtleties of their disagreement, uh, there's a certain texture to that. And I can't really explain that to you in terms of it's a, it's a science. It's not a science as much as it's an art. Yeah. But you start to recognize there's a little variations. And I'm starting to see these same variations in the gospel hey, accounts, hey, hey, which hey, I think to me— Jay, yeah. Jay could, could we pause right there? Because there's some there's a question in the chat that actually relates directly to what okay, you just good. said. Uh, Denny Wong, yeah. Denny Wong asked. Uh, this was earlier before you ever started talking about this. He's uh, he he asked why different accounts of the empty tomb. And as soon as I as yeah. soon as I saw that, I, I didn't I didn't have uh, I didn't have your training, but I know fr from my personal experience when I was so I was in jail. I was in jail and I was studying the gospels. Right, right. I was studying the gospels just because it, I thought it would make it right. e I thought it would make it easier to make fun of Christians. And I remember reading, my, my view was always that, you know, the Christians, they had their guy. I mean, that you know, the followers of Jesus, that was their guy. They believed he was, he's the Messiah. He died. They wanted to keep the movement going. So they invented this story and then they put together these sources. Right. And the first time, the first thing that ever got me to doubt my little theory about how where, where the New Testament came from was... Yeah. The, the story of Legion in, in Mark and Luke mm. and how it, it refers to one demoniac in one and it refers to two in the other. And I was just thinking, wait a minute, if they're, if they're sitting there collaborating and coming up with these stories like I thought, right. then these should match up perfectly, but they don't, which means there's some, there's some kind of independence going on here. And it means that Christians never decided to reconcile that. So in other words, Christ, right. Christians in the 4th, 5th, 6th century who are copying this, they, they would notice, wait a minute, one talks about one and the other one talks about two. What's going on here? So that actually made me doubt my explanation, uh, my trying to explain away Christianity. And so I was actually, whoa, these differences actually make me think that it's reliable. Whereas there are, there are lots of people, especially like Muslims and so on, who... If they see any sort of difference in testimony like that, they say, "Aha! You see, it's corrupt and it's all lie. You can't trust any of That's it." Right. But, but so I'm, right. I'm guessing you're along you're along similar lines, but based on lots of training and yes. experience. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, the first thing we ask when we get called out in the middle of the night, and I live about maybe 45 miles from where I, I serve, mm-hmm. and and so it'll take me a while to get there. In Los mm-hmm. Angeles, in the middle of the night, it's pretty open, so I can probably be there in an hour dressed. So I call dispatch before I go in, I'll tell them, I'll say, I'm going to be about an hour before I get there at a murder scene, because I'm the homicide detective going to get called out. And I'll say, I'll be there in an hour. Just do me a favor. Have the officers who are there separate the eyewitnesses. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't separate those eyewitnesses, you're going to get one story five or six times. What I want are five or six slightly different stories. Because no one's wrong here. But what happens is, is that your personal background, who you are, what you've experienced, what you're interested in, what scared you, what didn't scare you, these are the things that determine how you see a crime when it occurs. And what you're reporting on. And unless if I see in real time that there's a difference between uh, the accounts, well, then I might ask a follow up question without trying to tip off what I already know from the other witness. But I know that in the end, there's going to be some uh, seemingly irreconcilable differences that defense attorneys are going to have a fun day with when they finally get to trial. I get that. But there are going to be differences. This is the sad name. But I want to preserve the differences because I get the opportunity to puzzle those together to get the most robust picture of what happened. And I don't care if this happened 30 years ago or if it happened 30 minutes ago. A a crime that occurs 30 minutes, when I get there, it's only, it has been like two hours since it happened. And they still agree. Mm -hmm. But this is the nature. This is why anytime I see a biblical theorist who tries to accommodate the differences by saying they've got some theory about, let's say, for example, um, you know, there's a genre in the first century that allows you to, 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 to say things that aren't necessarily true. Okay, look, this is only because you've never talked to eyewitnesses that you don't recognize that this is always the case. And by the way, if you look at the church fathers, read the Antonicene church fathers, you will see that they are quoting I've got a slide I can show you later if you want. Uh, how many times they quote the different Gospels, each one. And what you'll see is that this is obvious to them really early. Like the students of the eyewitnesses, the students of John, the students of Paul, they're quoting from all of the Gospels. It's not like they didn't see. These don't seem to match. Because you're right. The first thing I'm thinking you're going to do is get rid of the differences. Mm-hmm. You know, you have, even when you have... Um, a harmonies, like Tatian's harmony of the four Gospels, he doesn't remove the differences. It's not like he's like trying to. No, there's they, they get it. As a matter of fact, some of the Antonicene Church fathers, the very earliest students of the eyewitnesses, will say the same thing I'm saying: that each person brings his own um, background into it. So, for example. I learned a long time ago that if I want to really know exactly what the suspect was wearing, I'm looking for a female witness. Men are terrible with clothing. And they'll say things like, you know, like you've got a pattern on your shirt. It's far better. Now, unless, unless of course, there's somebody who happens to own that shirt, the same shirt that you have. Mm -hmm. Well, then he's going to give it to me in great detail. Why can this guy repeat it in great detail, but the other guy thinks you're wearing a white T-shirt? How can you be wrong about that? Look, it's green. It's got a pattern on the front. Well, this guy owns one of those, so he recognized it right away, and he's able to tell me exactly what it is. So a lot of who you are and uh, what you've experienced will shape the way you recall an event. And it might just be, for example, that you're talking about, well, this is the angel that talked. So I'm going to focus on that angel that talked. And if all I have is that one account, you'll think there was only one angel. Mm -hmm. But there can be two because this guy's only talking about the one that spoke. So a lot of this stuff is that never bothered me. When I was reading through the Gospels, it never shook me that they were different. In fact, that's what provoked me Mm -hmm. to take the next step. Mm -hmm. So for what it's worth. And so uh, you went on to put together... Mm. So, yeah, so I, I mean, about a six, about six months into this, you know, I was using a lot of I was the, the chief investigator, the chief and interviewer on our team. I had a five man team and a sergeant and of all the interviews that would be done, they would call me in to do the, all the interviews. And that happened for another 10 years. And as I was doing these, I remember um, I, I, they sent me to schools. And one of the schools they'll send you to is forensic statement analysis, where you're just trying to get a written statement from your suspect before you do the interview. And then you're assessing the written statement, which you're asking him to write in ink. One side of the page, he can't turn it over, is 24 lines. 
He has to write out everything that he did from the day, the time he woke up on the day of the murder until the time he went to bed on the day of the murder. And he's writing everything down. And then you're assessing it for deception indicators. Mm-hmm. You're looking for uh, opportunities where he's ch- picking optional words like adjectives and adverbs that'll give away his, his thinking or where he's changing pronoun use or deciding on a pronoun use. You know, he's calling his wife the wife. This is why I'm very picky about people who call their wife the wife. Not even your wife. You won't even claim your wife. You know, it's not even a possessive pronoun. It's the wife, right? Well, sometimes people just do that. No big deal. But if you've been calling her your wife, your wife during the course of the entire day, but at the time of the hour of the murder, she, you now refer to her as the wife, it may mean something. Now, this is an art as much as a science as well. Mm-hmm. But when I started to go through scripture, I started to use forensic statement analysis on the Gospels. It's particularly to test claims of the early church. Like, for example, Papias says that Mark is the scribe for Peter's sermons, and this becomes eventually the Gospel of Mark. So I wanted to know, is there any forensic evidence in the statement that would incline me to believe that Peter is the source for Mark's Gospel? And so that kind of stuff went on for about six months, and my wife thought I was nuts. And at the end of that, I said to her, Man, I feel like these Gospels are telling me something reliable about Jesus of Nazareth. But here's what I don't get. And you tell me if you understand it, I said to her. Why would would Jesus, I mean, the Gospels explain that Jesus died on the cross. And I still was having a hard time with why would that be necessary? Like, why would God do it this way? In other words, I had developed a, a certain trust in the reliability of the Gospels, but still had no idea what the Gospel was. Follow me? Mm-hmm. So she said to me, I don't know. <laughs> so, well, that's the next step then we got to take because I don't, I don't get it. I mean, I don't get why it had to happen this way. And, and, that, and we spent probably another two months, you know, researching the letters of Paul. Uh, and I tell people all the time that I had to look and see what does the New Testament say about me? Not just what does it say about Jesus? What does it say about Jim? Because until you know you have a need for a Savior, you're not even understanding why anyone is a Savior. So I got to a place where I felt like, okay, I, I think I understand now. And, I, and so at some point, maybe six to eight months in, we decided that uh, we would give ourselves to Christ. Hmm. What, when was, uh, what, we, what year was that? I think it was 90, I think we started going to church in 96, and I think it was 97 when I became a Christian. All right, that's cool. I think it was 96, so. I think I was in 96 when I became a Christian, so uh, I'm, slight, there you go. I'm slightly older than you. Yes, that's right. I'm older, obviously, in in my appearance, if nothing else. Dude, when are you going to go gray, by the way? I keep on waiting for you to go gray. You should be gray by now. I actually have some in here. It's just hard to see. Um yeah, not like not not, not in my hair yet, but a little bit in my beard. But uh, yeah, um, all right. Well, that's awesome. We we, we do have uh, comments from uh, Carm M here. Okay. Carm is okay. saying. Carm says, uh, uh, off topic, but I'm a huge fan of Wallace. But for his detective work, I want to meet him. <laughs> Plus, I can help him solve his crime. I'm good at this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Now, all of us are good at this stuff. I'm actually, I'm, you know, I'm always working with production companies trying to figure out, like, what's the next thing we should try to be looking for on the ID channel or an oxygen channel or whatever. And, and man, I'll tell you, I am amazed at the um, viewership mm-hmm. of the ID channel. Mm-hmm. And do you realize it's about 60, 40 women? Wow. It is, it is mostly women who are huge fans of crime shows. I think that's interesting. interesting. I'm not quite sure I understand why that is, but that's just the way it is. Uh, yeah, and 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 Carm, Carm says, um, and we live close to each other. Tell him. So uh, next time you're speak, next time you're speaking at an event close to home, uh, Carm's going to walk up to you and she'll say, uh, that's right. "Hey, I was the one who saw you, uh, who talked to you on uh, David's live stream." All okay, right. Excellent. All right. Now, uh, but. I keep thinking of stuff I want to ask you while I have you here. So I'm yeah, going yeah, to I'm going to ask one more thing, one more thing. Yeah. One more thing and then we're going to jump into our topic. Okay. Conspiracy theories. Yeah. And the the reason I ask it because uh, it's 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 similar it's similar with what you with what what you were saying about you know gospel differences whereas you know I had no training in there but I had my I had my theory and when I see yeah. them start telling the story differently 
I start yeah. that made me trust it more rather than trust it yeah. less. Where there are lots of That's people reasonable. who say they trust it less be, because of that. But there's something similar. Yeah. So so you had it by training. I just there was something off with me. It's just no. Yeah. Oh, this doesn't fit with what I what with what I had believed before. But something similar with conspiracy theories. So I'm just saying that because I'm on YouTube all the time and they're everywhere, yeah. uh, not just in I videos, know. but in the comments section and every mass, uh, I, I would, uh, you know, I do videos when there's like an Islamic terrorist attack or something like that. Whenever yes. I post yes. it, if it was a shooting, I get flooded with conspiracy theories. David, how can you be so stupid? This is staged. <laughs> this is just a staged <laughs> attack by the government so they can come and take and take your guns. And and so I, it's it's always been in my mind with 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 all of these with you know the uh, the yes. the nine eleven conspiracy with the moon landing conspiracy yes. with the conspiracy that uh, uh you know it's a conspiracy to uh you know the pictures from space that show that the Earth is is yeah. spherical and not flat that's all a conspiracy and then every every shooting you know the Sandy Hook you know it, it was always it it was always just in my head like the number of the number of people that were involved in this conspiracy would have to be so massive right. and the temptation would be so huge afterwards to where you could yes. just get massively rich if you came out and exposed it. Like, like if you were the camera guy where they're, where they're in a studio yeah. film, filming the fake moon landing, if you were the, just That's the right. camera guy, you come out and publish a book, hey, I was the guy that was the camera Absolutely. man. Absolutely. Here's me standing behind the camera with, yes. with Neil Armstrong over there in the studio. And all of a sudden you're a multimillionaire. And the, and the conspiracy theorists, I mean, they, they go far with it. Like, no, the government would kill you instantly and you know stuff like this. And no, they yeah. wouldn't. I mean, if you put a book out there, that the, the, can't, they can't just run in there and kill you. The book's already out there, right? So, so it's right. always been in my head, like, no, the number of people, he, the number of people who would need to be involved would be so astronomical that uh, obviously, even if you find trouble with the story, like, oh, you know, you know, the, that angle of light is, you know, confusing me with the moon landing or, uh, you know, the way this building fell on 9-11, that seems more consistent yeah. with demolition than with a plane crashing yeah. into it. It's always in my head. Well, even if you find something more, you know, something improbable, it's still far less probable that it's this massive conspiracy, right? Yes. And so yes. That, that's just always kind of how it how it felt. But I saw you speaking at a conference one day, and you're actually breaking it down about conspiracies. And if they're if basically you were saying that if it's more than a few people, it's, the the, yeah, the larger yeah. basically the larger it is, the more quickly it's going to break down. Yeah, especially think about it, just in terms of before I even kind of give you the outline of that, I, I I will tell you that that if you think about the generation in which we live where it used to be that powerful people controlled the information. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to get the word out and no one on NBC was willing to interview me, I couldn't get it out, right? In my generation, I'm talking about when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Now, 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 clearly, I can, I can do all of this. Look at the quality of the broadcast you're doing on a weekly basis. Look at the quality on a nightly basis. Look at the quality, the number of people you are reaching through your channel. Look, it's, it's now the, the, the funnel that kind of controlled information to other people has, is wide open. And the quality is just is out there. If you can if you can make a case and you got the evidence, you can make that case. And it's really hard to be restricted by powerful people in this generation. That's why it's even more and more unlikely that there are successful conspiracies. Are there successful conspiracies? Of course. But if you think you know of one, it wasn't successful because by definition, mm -hmm. successful conspiracies are never uncovered. I mean, we just don't look at them, right? Now, mm -hmm. uh, there are, we know, I have to, I, I, I used to work gangs. I worked gangs for two years in Los Angeles County. And back in those days, it was mostly MS-13. It was, it, was, it was local gangs in Los Angeles County that would come into our town to do crimes. And they would never do them alone. They would always be in a group. So I often would add the conspiracy charge to the booking because it holds a much higher penalty. Mm -hmm. And you actually are working organized crime codes as well. My whole point is you learn how to work conspiracies. So I will tell you the five things that have to be in place in order for it to, to pull it off. And, and, and the more that you lack these five things, the less reasonable the, the claim. So the first thing you're right, the smallest number of co-conspirators. It's easier for two people to tell a lie than it is for 22. That is, is common sense, right? So, so that's why you want the smallest possible number. If it requires an entire sector of the federal government to pull it off, really? Mm -hmm. I'm already out. Now, is it possible? Yes. Is it reasonable? No. 
And I'm not interested in possible because anything's possible. The standard is not beyond a possible doubt. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. So I just don't think I want to get involved in, in theories. That's why people do the same thing with me. They're constantly emailing me theories that they wish I would investigate. Well, it's because I know what makes a successful conspiracy. Second thing, you want to hold it for the shortest possible period of time. So, for example, if I've got 10 people involved in a conspiracy and we all do it together, I'm the ringleader, right? And we do this together and then I'm able to systematically quickly in the first year kill the other nine, I'm going to get away with it because there's no one who can rat me out because I've killed all my co-conspirators. If you've got two, kill your partner. Now you're going to get away with it because it's no longer a conspiracy of two. It's just one perp. Okay, I get that. Third thing, excellent communication between co-conspirators, because what's going to happen is at some point, one of you is going to get jammed up by the authorities and someone's going to uncover something. What's the first thing we do when we have four people involved in a gang crime? We separate them before we start questioning, because we know we're going to get into the weeds on all the details of this crime. And at some point, they're going to slip up. They, don't, they haven't pre-planned everything they're going to say to the police. Fourth thing, if you've got a family relationship or, and better yet, some, rela some relationship to the case that actually is greater, you would rather suffer being uh, dying for the, for the lie than, than this other alternative. And most of the time that's about relationships. So for example, if, if, if a, a mom does a crime with her kid, she's not going to rat off her kid. Mm -hmm. She'd rather just die with a secret. She'll say, I'm not going to waive my rights and talk to you at all. Because I'm not going to give you any statement because this is her kid involved. Now, if it's the neighbor who's abused her kid who's involved, she's probably going to rat him off. Okay, so so you're looking for those kinds of familial relationships. And the last thing is, is that you want to reduce the amount of pressure that's being applied. If no one's looking and no one's asking and no one's pressuring, you might get away with this. Mm -hmm. But this is harder in the age in which we live because people are just making claims on, online. I mean, you can get a Twitter storm. Uh, immediately, and then suddenly you've got all this pressure, which is just coming from Twitter. A hashtag can apply pressure. So, so if you don't have those five things, it's really hard to pull this off. Mm -hmm. And that's why, typically, when someone says, "Yeah, I've got this um, this conspiracy that involves hundreds and hundreds of people at NASA that are trying," and, and really all this time has gone by, and no one's wanted to cash that out, no one's wanted to make money from that claim. No one's wanted to tell the truth and just be the, the, the they would be on every single show on podcasts and on radio and on TV and on the online. Really, no one's going to no one's going to have a New York Times bestselling book because they know they can simply cash this out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's possible. It's just not reasonable. And I don't entertain stupid possibilities. Yeah. And uh, especially have the issue with the government conspiracies where. Right. Each new each new administration that come comes in could just completely destroy right. the opponent. Uh, you know, and they're, they're and they're yeah. motivated to do it. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. another great thing is that it really is is about. So there's a couple of ways I've thought about and tried to refine those five. So those are the five things that investigators try to unwrap when we get in a conspiracy uh, a conspiracy case. We're trying to undo it. So I'll give you an example. So I had a guy who was killed in our city uh, about ten years ago now. And a nice old man. He was in his 60s. And, and I would get there, and he's tied up. He's been executed. He's in his side yard. And uh, the officer who was in, assigned the case, he's the I.O. He was waiting for me because I was the senior investigator, but it wasn't going to be my case. I'm working cold cases. This is a fresh case. He says, hey, dude, I think we, we got a couple of people involved in this. And I can see from the way he was tied up, it would not be easy to do that with one person. Mm -hmm. So I think oh, you're right. There's more than one person involved. He says, well, we know who one of them is. Do you want us to go out and arrest that guy? I said, well, he's not going like, to suddenly confess to you. We have a surveillance team. Let's go surveil this guy for a while. So we watched this guy for four days. And sure enough, he's driving around in the victim's car mm -hmm. with another guy. So it, here's his, co his cohort, right? He's right. He's with him. So we watch him for like four days, and then we find, eventually take him to jail, but we don't tell him. He, they've got traffic warrants. So we tell him we're taking him to jail for traffic warrants. First thing we do, we know that, first of all, they have a small number of co-conspirators, just two. So they win that battle. They've only had to hold the lie for four days. They're kind of winning that battle. Um, but they were not related to each other. So we win that one. Mm -hmm. So now what we're going to do is we're going to defeat the communication issue. We bring them in. We separate them. I wait two hours, go into the first interview. Dude, 
just got done talking to your partner, which I hadn't. Uh, he's the last two hours. He told me everything you guys did. He told me how you did the crime, and he told me everything you've done in the last four days. And then I repeat to this knucklehead everything that our surveillance team saw him do for the last four days, as if that guy just told him. That's why I wanted to surveil him. Now he has no idea because he can't communicate with the other. So he doesn't know if that's true or not. And he gives me a little bit more. Then I go back to the other guy. Dude, I spent the last two and a half hours talking to your buddy. He told me all this stuff. He confessed. Okay. He had enough of it. It was not, they were not related. And he felt like I'm not going down for this guy. This is the killer over here. So he gives me that guy. You see what we're doing? We're simply unwrapping the five things that are necessary for a conspiracy. That's why when you hear conspiracy theories going forward, be more modest about thinking they're true. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, uh, your latest research. Yes. Is I'm looking on, forward to this, David. Is on the impact of Christianity, uh, specifically on science and education so is this is this for a right. for a book you're going to be working on or yes it's a book and i'm going to tell you that uh i've been looking forward to this i talked to um our mutual friend richard howe uh about having this conversation with you and and so i'm, I'm looking for uh some expert advice on, on this that i can then uh either quote or uh, at least say that david was a great guy in the book so i want to be able to uh, run this by you because i noticed something in my research that honestly bugged me and I thought, ah, you know, I, David Wood's probably the best person. And then you happened to send me uh, an email. Hey, do you want to be on the show? And I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. So this is a perfect opportunity. So what we're going to do in front of all these folks is think out loud for a little bit. And I want to just show you what I'm seeing. And I'm going to show up. By, so when I write a book, I, I create the visual uh, talk first. Because I, I, I figure if I can create what I would put in front of a jury, it's going to be a better book. So I spent almost a year just creating hundreds of presentations. And then once those are done, I will write a book. So I call this speaking visualish instead of English. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to, I'm going to share a screen with you here in a second. And I just want to get your input on this. And you and I haven't talked that much about this. So, so I, I think it's going to be great. It's just in the sense of hopefully here's what I'm seeing. First of all, the, I want to talk about two things with you. Number one, it's I'm fascinated by the claim that if you are a Christian believer, that somehow you are a science denier, like there's no connection. Be, you couldn't be a, somebody who's yeah. interested in the sciences if you're a Christian believer. Mm -hmm. And of course, you and I know that's, that's ridiculous. As a matter of fact, a very strong case can be made that science is the result of the, the medieval monk who the, the, whose theology paved the way for the explosion of science. Mm -hmm. And Christians have always been at the tip of the spear when it comes to scientific discovery. Mm -hmm. So I want to show you a, uh, a, a presentation I, I, I'm working on that um, just talks about that in chart form. So I'm going to start it here, and then I'm going to uh, go to a share screen, and you and I will kind of figure out how we do this as we go here. So I'm now sharing that screen. You have a couple of options here. So I'm going to go ahead, and uh, you can hopefully get this on, on, online. Yep, I believe I have the technology and... All right. Uh, okay, so you're up on the screen. Okay, so there it is. So this is the kind of a, the last four thousand years. You've got now on one end, and way back when, to 2020 BC on the other end. What I noticed in terms of the progress of science over this four thousand year period is that it starts off pretty modestly, right? Where it's just going to be the formation of some basic philo philosophical, logical principles and mathematics that will just become the foundation for great thinkers who advance the sciences later. And then you have a period of just pretty much static, uh, periodic appearance of, 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 uh, of scientists, you know, that are uh, appear over the course of history. And then you start to see this weird set of bumps. Now here, this little bump has got, it's kind of slopes up gently then it has a plateau. And then you have another bump that occurs after it. And then you have a, yet another bump. And then you have this huge explosion called the scientific revolution. And that typically is the, from 1500 to 1700, right in that range right there. Okay. Now, I think this is interesting to see the growth of this. is, And I went back. Honestly, I have a research assistant. We looked at every notable science scientist rather in every discipline historically 
And it took forever. It's about a 100-page document just listing scientists and their backgrounds. So this is where Jesus falls in the history of this explosion of science. He falls right there. Now, what's interesting to me is why doesn't all of this happen over here? Like, why doesn't it happen before Jesus? It's not like there weren't smart people. If you if you ever read Socrates and Plato, you're going to, they're like your, your head's going to explode, right? I mean, there's a lot of stuff there. There's smart people on that side of Jesus, on the left side, and there's all the resources. If you want to build a telescope, you could have built that telescope earlier than it was built. Why doesn't it happen over here? Instead, it all happens over here. So that's interesting. It seems to me there's a trigger point here. And if you look at the bumps, you'll see that even the smallest little bumps are attributed to Jesus. And it's been said that the medieval Christian monk was the intellectual ancestor of the science scientist. And, and what, it, what is it that made it possible for science to emerge in the human race? It's the medieval insistence on the rationality of God. In fact, science as an organized, sustained enterprise arose only once in human history. And it didn't arise anywhere other than Europe in the civilization that was called Christendom. Why? Well, okay, so here's our bump. Our first little bump. It's just kind of a slight incline. Well, it happens to coincide with the Roman edicts and the Edict of Milan, the Edict of Thessalonica, that either reduce hostility toward Christians and then make Christianity the, the uh, religion of the empire. So that, I think, is interesting that it happens to coincide with that. Now, there's another bump here, this plateau here of about five centuries. That happens to coincide with the cathedral schools, which are the precursors, by the way. All the cathedral schools in the monasteries are what eventually became universities. And those are Christian. I mean, they just are. I mean, I don't know how you can deny the role that Christianity has played in education. Now, this is the bump I wanted to ask you about, because I'm sure you've heard it. It turns out in these Dark Age centuries that are usually called the Dark Age, or the Middle, it's called the Middle Ages. Okay, the Middle Ages are dominated by Muslims. They just are. Now, are there Christians in here? Yeah. Of course. I mean, there's many Christians over the centuries. It's not like Christianity drops off. It continues to slowly build over the years. But there's a burst of activity, mostly in astronomy, by Muslims right here. That's what we're going to talk about. Now, let me show you the next bump. Here's the next bump right here. Why does that happen? Well, that happens largely because the first universities and the first three were in uh, Bologna, Paris, and Oxford. Those three universities are all Christian universities. The first three universities from which all universities are descended are Christian. Now, what's this bump over here? Well, this bump over here is a printing press. At least I know the printing press was, it was, it opened up ideas and suddenly stuff was available uh, that wasn't available before. And finally, right at the same time as the scientific re revolution, curiously, um, the Reformation occurs. Now, why I think that's important is because some Sometimes people will argue that, that, that Christianity is hostile to, the, uh, to science, and they're usually quoting the, the experience that Galileo had, but that's not with Christianity. He had that experience with the Roman Catholic authority. It does seem there's a relationship between overarching dominant authority and the progress of this, because once that's lifted, for example, and the Reformation occurs, you suddenly have an explosion of scientific thought. Which to me means that it's capitalizing on the foundation of Christianity rather than being limited by any overarching authority. Now, I'm going to come off this for a second because I want to just talk about – let's go back. I'm going to, I think I can actually – hang on. While we're here, I can actually draw on this. Yeah, let me draw on this. Okay, so, so this is the thing I want to talk about with you. Mm -hmm. Here's what's interesting about this. If you look at this group, this group, and probably actually including a lot in this group too, this is this is where all Muslim influence is, right in here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if you go to the scientific revolution, they're missing. You will not see this kind of dominance over here. By the way, what's dominant over here? Christians. The father of every major discipline from modern astronomy to modern botany to modern biology, whatever it is, they're Christians. So why is it that that there's Muslims here, and then they 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 are not over here? Something happens. Now I I read a book, uh, and it's, I'll tell you, it, 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 you know, it was hard for me because I thought this was a pretty deep, lot of detail, uh, and it's called the closing of the Muslim mind. It's trying to explain why this happened, why suddenly. Islam does not contribute to the scientific revolution in the same way that Christianity does. So let me just back out of that now. 
and I'm going to stop sharing this screen here. Stop sharing. So now I'm back with you. Um, okay, and I'll, I'll go back to that in a second. I just want you to see, though, that's – so that's the biggest – question I have for you is why do you, because I'm sure you're getting this right from Muslim apologists who would say hey hey we dominate the sciences and for a season in the dark ages you could actually say that yep. so what changed yeah well uh, uh, interestingly um, the um, early centuries of Islam were periods of pretty rapid expansion and so as they're expanding I mean they're expanding so Islam ex just basically takes over Arabia and you had uh, a, a variety of uh, philosophers who were in Arabia who were uh, continuing to copy the works of the Greeks and so on. Um, so basically, you have the, the traditional areas of learning. You had sort of, you know, Southern Europe, uh, Greece and Rome and so on. You had uh, Northern Africa, places like Egypt. And they had the, you know, the, great, the great library of Alexandria and so on. And in the Middle East, something, things, interesting things would happen, like a Roman emperor would cast out heretics or something like that, and they would move down there to the Middle East and they would stay there, but they would have, they would have their books that are considered heretical and so on. And so you end up with sort of patches of uh, different sources and Islam and, and, you know, that that's that's, you know, northern Africa and Europe and so on. But that that goes all the way out uh, across the, the Middle East, all the way out into India. And so you have different areas that are working on mathematics and so on. Right. And Islam just conquers these areas one after another. Right. And in the area of uh, I'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. I'm sure it was parallel in um I'm sure it was parallel in science because back then uh, science and philosophy weren't really uh, distinguished. But there, there were there were times when people would go to an area and all of a sudden they would have the works of Aristotle and they would go before the Muslim caliph and say, "Can we research and study these works and see what comes mm -hmm. of it to see if it is of benefit, if it is of benefit to the Muslim?" community. And so you had you had periods where the caliphs would say yes by by all means and and other times where the caliphs would say I don't know. I mean, we've already got the perfect knowledge with uh, with with Islam. And so uh, what you find is that as Islam expands and uh, encounters all of these uh, all of these different areas and these different classical works and so on that Islam does have a period where philosophy just explodes, right? I mean, if you study, if you study the history of philosophy, you 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 encounter Averroes and Avicenna and, and these kinds of guys, and so you have that. But you also have um, you also have the, these scientists, and and you emphasize the astronomy, but also in in medicine, they were developing yeah, yeah, they were developing no techniques in medicine, yep. uh, engineering. They were building some awesome stuff. It was, it was more it was yeah. more it's more practical stuff, right? It's more practical stuff in the in the sense of you know how can we build a better clock and how can we build a better this and how we how can we build yeah. a better that and 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 so on so you you see this in Islam and you have all these disciplines mathematics science philosophy and Islam will move into an area and something will will have a a burst of a of a couple of centuries of uh, sort of a, not an not nearly to the extent as you have with the scientific revolution but you have a, a brief flourishing. But then it just it just dies. It just suffocates. And then there's almost nothing there until, you know, um, until the modern period when Muslims are looking back to that and saying, you see, we could do science, too. And yeah, that we, we know you could do science. Anyone could do science. Right. Uh, right, every, right. Every, everyone has made you know discoveries. The Chinese made discoveries. Indians made discoveries. Why did it not last in Islam, but it lasted in Christianity? Right. And um, I, I haven't I haven't. I haven't read anything like uh, the closing of the Muslim mind or any of these other sources from just from reading the Muslim sources and being familiar a bit with uh, with with why things took off in Christianity. My my best guess would be uh, one they have they have kind of a different view of human beings and their role and what revelation is and I think these things play a role in why you see such a why you see such a difference so in is in islam the attitude in islam that goes back to muhammad is that without god telling you through a prophet something uh you just don't know you 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 don't know and you can't figure it out and this is so thoroughly ingrained into muhammad's mind and the in the and in, into the minds of his companions that you literally do not know how to go to the bathroom properly without Muhammad telling you. You do not know how to urinate 
properly. You do not know how to go number two properly. He has to give you detailed instructions. You do not have to know how to wipe properly. You do not know how to groom yourself properly. He had people on schedules of this is how often you have to pluck your armpit hairs. And this is how often you have to, you need to be told by a prophet every little detail of what you think and what you believe. And so it's this attitude of we're sort of just completely helpless and ignorant in the absence of God coming and telling us right. something. And whereas science, it, unless it's unless it's something that God told you, science is based on no, no, no. We can go out there. We can figure this out. We can right. we can we can get through the mysteries and so on. We can unlock the the secrets of the universe. And that just doesn't seem to be there in Islam. And you. It, it, there's sort of competing, you know. There, there's sort of these competing trends because you do have in Islam, uh, even in even in the Quran, a strong, a strong thrust of natural theology. It's it's hey, look at the world, look at the universe. Come on, look around at this. You know that this has a creator. You have access to your creator by you know you know that he exists because of because of the the, the world around you. But uh, be, sort of beyond that, it's just, uh, yeah, you can figure out that God exists, but you can't figure much else out because God, God has to tell you. And so I think there's a different view. Um, well, there's definitely a different view in Christianity. And in Christianity, you know, I read about what we are in, in Christianity and, and we're created in the image of God. And we ask, you know, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? And almost everyone links it to our to our intellect and our our, our moral yes. our moral capacity. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you, you've got God, and God designs the universe. God is this creator. We're created in the image of God. This means we, if anyone's in a position to figure this stuff out to understand it, we are. And if you uh, uh, if you look, and I, I argued this in my debate with um uh, my debate with Michael Shermer, where before 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 the debate i looked i looked up michael sherman i saw that he had a a phd in right in the history of science and i thought wow that's cool uh I, let me just go right at his strength and i'll i'll base my entire argument on the history of science and so um i argued because the topic was does god exist and you know there are all kinds of arguments we could give i gave one argument that that basically all of science confirms christian theism and how I uh, and and that's why earlier when when you were saying that you know science is a is a product of Christianity, I view this is this is why I can never take atheism seriously as uh, it claims to be the champion of science. I believe that every scientific uh, every scientific confirmation every every hypothesis every scientific hypothesis has been confirmed ever is simultaneous confirmation of of Christian theism. And, and the reason I say that is, I argued in my opening statement, I said, uh, um, you know, for, for these guys who are back then, we're, we're basically all parasitic on, on the work that they did. Uh, because back then, if you wanted to figure out something like the law of gravity or anything like that, any sort of law of motion, I mean, you, you, you have to start from scratch and you have to sit there and say, okay, here's all the data on the motion of these things. And now let me figure out an equation that makes sense of all of this and that is such a nightmare that you're talking you're talking decades of work to try and figure these things out you're not going to sit there and say hey i'm gonna i'm gonna dedicate decades of my life to figuring out these neat little equations unless you already believe that there is a mathematical order to everything out there that there's right. a mathematical right. yeah and so you look at how these guys viewed this and this is the connection to the to the medieval monks and the universities is they viewed the universe as the product of this uh, divine intellect, and they viewed God as this uh, cosmic architect and mathematician who's in the in the in the drawings and so on. They would have God with like a you know a compass and so on like that, right? And uh, you know architect tools and stuff like that designing yeah. the universe. So that's how they think of God, and so they they think of god that way and so they believe that the universe is a product of a creative intelligence and so they believe that the universe can be understood there are actually laws right. there are laws out there governing any governing everything if you if you could figure them out you would know how all of these things work and so that that's sort of that's sort of step 1 and what's interesting yeah. there is i think islam has that first step. Islam has that first ingredient that there's this, you know, cosmic intelligent creator out there and so on. I don't, I think Islam lacks the, the, the second feature and the third, the, and the third feature. The, the second feature is that we're created in the image of God. 
And Islam does have trends that we're created in the image of God, but it's more like we're created in the shape of God. And they're very confusing yeah, yeah. sources mm -hmm. where uh, God is, when Adam is created, he looks like a copy of God and Satan actually can't tell the difference between them and so on. He's trying to figure out, you know, the difference. And, and so that, that's more like it, but very different in, in Christianity. But in, uh, in, in, in Christianity, um, we, you know, viewing ourselves as, as the image of God, it's, it's very, where that came in in the scientific revolution is they're thinking that it's our, our intellects. Our intellects are created yeah. in, the, in the image of God. Wait a minute, if God is this, you know, divine architect and he's putting all this stuff together with all these mathematical rules, well, we're the sorts of things that can figure that out. We're the sorts of things right. that can go out there mm -hmm. and find that out. And so that gave them the confidence. That, so those, those two things gave them the confidence that, hey, we'll go out and dedicate our lives to this because we believe that it can be figured out. Notice, if you were, if you were an atheist, you have no reason to think that, you know, if I drop this cup, it's going to follow an equation. Why in the world would this thing follow an right. equation? Why would everything obey these neat little equations? Well, they had reasons to think that, and they believed it before they went out and, and figured these things out. So they go out. They believe that the universe can be understood. It's intelligible. They believe that they're created in the image of the creator, and therefore they are the kinds of things that can go out and figure it out. And the third thing is they believe that it's that it's good to figure out. We all believe that it's good mm -hmm. to invent an air conditioner if it can, keep, it can keep you cooler or something like that. The, yeah. the, this. But when you're talking about, you know, what is a quasar or things like that, it's not stuff that has a lot of relevance for us. And so you in order to do that, you just have to believe that, that knowledge is good, that knowledge is a good thing. And so they believe that because of their worldview. They believe that if we're created in the image of God, and God is the one who, do, who, who made all of this the way it is, and we're equipped to figure these things out, well, it's actually good if we do, because the more we learn, the more we're learning about God. And they viewed, right. they viewed that as, as, right. as, as parallel to studying the scriptures. We study yeah. the scriptures to learn more about God, but we can actually study the universe to learn more about how God is, how God is at work. And so I, I basically put all those together and I said, uh, in my debate, I said, you've got scientific hypotheses, but there is the scientific hypothesis, the all caps, right? The right. scientific hypothesis. And the scientific hypothesis basically says, if our worldview is correct, then this is how the universe is. Uh, it's intelligible. We're the kinds of things that can go out and figure it out. And it's good that we go out there and figure it out. And now we're gonna go out there and all of science is basically a testing of that hypothesis. And all of science, right. all of science has confirmed that hypothesis. And so every time any atheist or whoever uh, performs a scientific experiment and says, oh, my scientific experiment has, has, has been confirmed, that simultaneous confirmation of that initial scientific hypothesis before they went out and did all the research was, this is how we are predicting the world is. And this is what we predict. We predict that we're going to be, we're, we're, we're going to find all this order and that we're going to be the kinds of things that can figure out. And this is going to just be this explosion of knowledge. And they were absolutely correct. And so it's all, uh, I, I think that's why you have the scientific revolution occurring in Christianity uh, with Islam. And, and uh, you could, you could take it, you could take it after this because uh, I've been talking for a long time, but you asked me, um, I just want yeah, to give no, you, no, I want to hear it. Yeah. Excellent. Since, yeah, since you were, since you were wondering this, I, I just want to give you, because what I was saying was in, in Islam, they had this attitude of, you have to be told what to believe and beyond that you're just wasting your time you can't figure you can't figure something yes. out beyond what god has what god has shown you and so just to kind of uh show you that while you were asking i pulled up a couple of muslim sources okay. um so let me go to this is from sahih al-bukhari and it's a it's a chapter heading um sahih al-bukhari 3198 so this is the chapter heading right before sahih al-bukhari it's right after 30 Right after 3198, I believe I can get this up on the screen. Uh, let me see. I have the technology. I always do. That's right. That's um, right. All right. Share screen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have this source here. So this is this is commentary. So this is uh, the chapter heading mm -hmm. in Sahih al-Bukhari, 3198. And it's Abu Qatada. Abu Qatada is one of Muhammad's companions. And so Abu Qatada mentions Allah's statement, and indeed we have adorned the nearest heaven with lamps. So you have, uh, uh, just so you know, Jay, you have verses of the Quran which say, which explain what stars are. And stars are missiles that Allah uses to shoot demons when they try to sneak into heaven. And that's why when you see a shooting star, if you see a star shooting across the sky, it's because a demon was trying to sneak into heaven and hear Allah's plans, and Allah caught him 
and so hurled a star at the demon to knock him out of to knock him out of okay. uh, out of heaven and then that's what a shooting star is so multiple multiple problems there but uh you have here i'm going to go ahead and quote this is one of muhammad's companions commenting on this on, on this verse of the quran he said the creation of these stars is for three purposes and they are one as decoration of the nearest heaven two as missiles to hit the devils and three as signs to guide travelers and here's what he says so this is a companion of muhammad so if anybody tries to find a different interpretation he is mistaken and just and just wastes his efforts and troubles himself with what is beyond his limited knowledge yeah so notice here's what allah has revealed about what these stars are for and he specifically says, if anyone tries to find something else, something beyond that, you are mistaken and you waste your time and you're troubling yourself with something that is beyond your limited knowledge. Well, if you actually, if you actually absorb that attitude, you're not, you're not going to be the sort of person who runs out and starts trying to do all kinds of That's right. uh, scientific yeah. research. <laughs> For right. sure. Yeah. And uh, I'll do one more. I'll do one more quotation here uh, that yep. I think is helpful. And then we will go back to you because you will have my... Yeah, no, my, no, no I, I want to talk about Yeah, for sure. Go, go ahead. You will have my... This will be my, my full response here. Um, let's go back. Let me see if I can get this up on the screen. Oh, that's too low. All right, let's see. All right, so this is... This is Tafsir Jalalain's commentary on Surah 88, verse 20, which uh, modern translations try to try to hide this, but uh, very clearly says, says that the earth was laid out flat. And uh, the two Jalals here go into um, go into a little dispute between the Muslim scholars and the astronomers. So this is during a time when when Islam has its astronomers. And so this is uh, the, one of the most famous Muslim commentaries of all time on Surah 88, verse 20, which talks about the earth being laid out flat. And they, uh, the two Jalals say, And the earth how it was laid out flat, and thus infer from this the power of God, exalted be he and his oneness. The commencing with the mention of camels uh, is because they are closer in contact with the earth than any other animal, blah, blah, blah. As for his word, sutehat, meaning laid out flat, this on a literal reading suggests that the earth is flat, which is the opinion of most of the scholars of the revealed law and not a sphere as astronomers have it, even if this latter does not contradict any pillars of the law. So it's not contradicting Sharia yeah, if, you, yeah. if you say that, uh, that the earth is a sphere. But notice they're setting, them, so they're setting this up as a dispute between scholars of the revealed law. So scholars of Islamic yes. law and Sharia and versus the astronomers and so we the experts in uh, the revealed law understand that it's flat and it's not a sphere as the astronomers have it and so basically in uh, i think really i think in, in in christianity i mean you do you do you do have no. your you do have your disputes you do have uh instances where the uh, Although the main examples that atheists give of the, you know, the, the conflict between, you know, science and the church uh, are generally, generally fabricated. But you do have instances of, you know, banning certain books and things like that. But on the whole, all of this, all of this development comes in, in Christian areas. Uh, every, every key figure, every figure in the scientific revolution was a Christian of one variety or another, Protestant, mm -hmm. Catholic, or some sort of, you know, heretical view, but they all believed in God. They all believed in the Bible and they're all in Christian areas. And a bunch of them are, are funded by the church to go out and do their research. And so it's easy to pick out and say, ah, here's this example of some sort of conflict where right, right, yeah, the yeah, whole, yeah, right. the, I mean, you're talking multiple countries, multiple churches, multiple figures, yes. multiple denominations, all producing this this massive revolution and this follows upon massive setbacks like the bubonic plague i mean society is just being yeah. crushed to almost nothing and they work through it and produce the scientific revolution there's obviously something there uh, that we just don't find in uh in in other ideologies yeah no i'm with you it's interesting that you brought all that up because uh you haven't read that book the closing of the muslim mind but it seems that that's exactly where he lands it also what the the the, the claim and not again because it's uh, this the book i'm writing is not about islam but i just happened to see that plateau of of, of islamic scientists 
that exist in the Dark Ages, in the Middle Ages. So I, I want to be able to understand why did that stop? Because if you go back and look, and I'll show you in a second, but it's, it's pretty crazy what happens next. Now, now this is what the argument they made. It's almost like the same kind of debate that happens theologically within Christendom, right? Between how free is man and how capable is man at studying his environment and how sovereign is God and God's word about what it might say about the environment, right? We see this in Christendom also. This debate about well, you know, there's this is why we have some uh, apologists that are evidentialists like me, and some apologists that are presuppositionalists, right? They come out of two theological camps, and what separates us often is just this idea that I'm not sure that, you know, from a presuppositional position, is they're not sure that we have the rational uh, rational ability as fallen creatures to actually even well, the same thing is happening within Islam. It appears, like you said, there are ways to make a case for either. Well, this author in the closing of the Muslim mind says that that explosion of science that we saw on the part of Muslims was when the dominant, at least the idea, the theological idea that men and women can actually examine their environment and come to reliable conclusions without being solely dependent on God's word, right? That seems to also exist within within that culture, within Islam. Within Islam. But eventually it is subsumed, it is uh, overtaken by the notion that you can't know anything outside of divine revelation. It's all special revelation, no natural revelation. Now, I don't know where that stands today, and maybe there's a better balance today within Islam between those two camps. But I can tell you that we seem to have always kind of had, that debate's been going on, uh, certainly since the Reformation, but we, we, we've seen it as a non-essential and maybe because there isn't, but see, you tell me, David, I, my sense of it is that Islam is diverse as whatever country holds to this and whatever group is holding to Islam. Is it as diverse as the kind of denominationalism we see within Christendom? Because the decentralization of authority actually helped us mm -hmm. because we now see each other as slightly different shades of the same color that we can actually go out and, and we get along with it. In other words, we, we have a core set of beliefs, but we have this liberty toward the non-essentials. Is that happening in Islam today? Um, yeah, you, 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 well, you had some, you, you, you have some problems in, in the Muslim world. You have uh, individual Muslim countries tend to be dominated by, you know, Sunnis or, you know, Sunnis, so that would be like Saudi Arabia or Shia. That would be the case with Iran and uh, minorities are usually uh, oppressed. You ended up in certain places like Iraq and Syria and uh, some so places like that where if you had some sort of more or less secular-ish leader that everyone was terrified of, so they're usually they're usually dictators. Um, they yeah. could they could kind of keep a lot of the the radical people in check and they would allow mm -hmm. would allow. Um, uh, uh, more diversity of, of belief. And so in Syria, you had all sorts of, you had, you know, you had Christians alongside, uh, you know, Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims and Druze and all, you had all of this in, um, uh, among, you know, in, in, in Syria. And I had a friend, I had a friend from Syria who moved here in the, in the 1980s, but he would go back, he would go back, uh, and visit and visit his family in Damascus. And he once said, he said, uh, I feel safer in Syria than I do in Dearborn, wow. Michigan. He said, I feel safer in Syria than I do in Dearborn, Michigan. And I said, what? What are you wow. talking about, man? You're a Christian. You're a Christian in Syria. I, I, know there, I know there are Muslims in the Middle East who would want to kill you. He goes, he goes in Syria? He says, any, any Muslim puts his hand on a Christian, he knows there are going to be soldiers dragging him out of his house in the middle of the night, taking him to the public square. And uh, he goes, they, they, wouldn't, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't dare touch us. Now, that, that unfortunately has, has changed in, in recent years. Syria uh, had a massive breakdown. But uh, basically, up until then, you can have... Uh, sort of secular leaders who impose uh, a kind of order on onto uh, onto society, and historically, you did have Muslim uh, Muslim leaders, Muslim leaders over the years who are who are who are more tolerant than than at other times. But uh, uh, in our time, apart from apart from some sort of more more secular ish leader who happens to be a dictator and everyone's scared of him. Uh, you kind of end up with one dominant, one dominant group, and everyone else is uh, mm. everyone else is uh, has to fall in line and is some sort of second class citizen. So, yeah, you've got a problem as far as as far as science now in the Islamic world, it 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 
it is in the Muslim mind. It is in the Muslim mind since the collapse of the caliphate with, with, world, with world war one since the caliphate collapsed you saw after that you saw places like uh, iran afghanistan if you look at pictures of these places from you know the 50s and 60s they you'd think that these were taken in the united states they started dressing they started right. dressing like westerners uh they wanted western technology the view was basically they beat us they beat us just because they're they're right they're right about the you know science and technology we need to become more more like them and so it's the west that you know this 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 came out of but it's 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 similar it's similar to atheists right i, I kind of view everyone now everyone who's who's uh, who's adopting a sort of christian view of the world i view them all as like heretical christians right they're they're we've accepted the entire christian worldview of the universe and ourselves but we just yes, don't we yes. just we just right. don't realize it yeah we just don't realize it and yeah. we don't see how our old our own worldview is completely at odds with everything that we've uh that, that right. we're, we are adopting so uh, a lot of a lot of places in the muslim world have adopted uh you know our views of science and so on that's why now you have tons of uh if, if you look on you know scientific papers and stuff like that you'll see all kinds of, of muslims and you know muslims involved in, in the research and so on yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so I want to show you this then, and I won't belabor the point, but this is what I saw. I'm going to go back to sharing this screen real quick. So I'm, I'm pulling it up right now. Okay, great. Now I'm going to go over here and share it. So here we go. Okay, so now you've got a couple of options here. And this is back where we were a minute ago when we were talking about this, this, um, the Reformation kind of accounting for this last bump here. Now, here's what's interesting to me. Um, if you look at that last four centuries, okay, that's where all of your, a lot of your science fathers, I call these the science fathers. So if you were just to do a Google search and say the father of modern botany, the father of modern biology, modern anatomy, I don't care what the discipline is, okay? All the way to modern, uh, the father of quantum mechanics. Just type it in. You're going to pull up a Christian. It's weird, right? I mean, we've now identified with, a, I've got a research assistant, we've identified 160 people who are identified as the father of these, everything from broad to really niche little weird scientific uh, fields. Mm -hmm. So this is the place where I look at this and I say, wow, look at that. That's, that's an oversized impact on science. Why? Why is that happening? Why are all of these folks, by the time you get to what's called the scientific revolution, that is dominantly Christian of every stripe. From Catholic, don't think Catholics aren't in there because they're in there, uh, to all the refer all, uh, all the the Protestant uh, denominations that they're all in there. So it's interesting to me. Now you might say, well, everyone was a. No, that's not true. That's not true. A lot of these folks are the sons of Christians, and they don't end up adopting the the, the faith of their fathers. So it's not like everyone in the world. Was, it's not true. But they do dominate the sciences. Now, why would that be the case? So here's where I wanted to hear your view. And I think this is, so I'll be taking what you just told me and wrapping it into my view too. The first thing I would say that ignites science amongst Christianity is because, yeah, we think that matter is good. Now, this is important because Plato did not think that matter was good. Matter was fallen, evil. A lot of, of, of thinkers, philosophical thinkers, prior to Christianity did not even think that matter was good. A lot of Gnostics did not believe that matter was good and worthy of study. But we think it is. Uh, that's a Christian development. Also, if you look at the pantheon of gods that preceded Christianity, I've put clothes on most of these people, okay? I went back in Photoshop and put clothes on all the women, okay? Because this is typically how the pantheon of Roma or Greek gods or Persian gods is seen. They're banqueting and they're having, you know, running around in, a, in an orgy. This is, this is typically how they're seen. But that's not how we view God. This is, we view, number one, this is a kind of the more reasonable pantheon of gods here. But if this is the case, there, there's no reason to expect order, Unless, of course, the Christian view is correct, and there is a singular, orderly, rational God, and there isn't a pantheon of gods who are chasing women and, and, and killing humans because they are lusting after their brides. I mean, if you read the mythologies that preceded Christianity, they are not good gods. They are not moral gods, and they're not orderly or rational. But we believe there is one. Here's the third igniter. We believe that you know, the, before the, the Christians came in, the pantheon of gods were often assigned. So Zeus is the god of lightning. He's holding lightning in his hand. Poseidon is the god of the ocean. That means that if something happens in lightning or something happens in the ocean, we cannot look for the, the law or the, the formula or the mathematics that might explain it because it might just be the willy-nilly behavior of a god. 
who is in control of it. And we don't believe that, of course. We believe that God is not in the creation, acting to make it happen actively, but is separate from his creation, and we can study the creation and, and, and see what, how, how it reflects the, 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 the logic or the, the natural law, we would say, that is rooted in God. The other thing is this, is that, you know, prior to Christians, the, the idea that, that matter is evil, I mean, not only that, but people that would not touch, no one was doing a dissection until Christians started doing dissections. And the reason why they were able to do them you know, philosophically and theologically is because they did not see a, a, a problem. In other words, Christ followers believed that humans could actually test and investigate God's creation, and they weren't afraid to touch matter. You know, th there were actually thinkers who preceded Christians who would not stoop to touching a cadaver. But, but we, we actually don't see a problem with that. Here's the next one. Uh, this is the school uh, university at Bologna, the first university ever. You can tell it's university because you see this guy right here? That's like every student at every college. That's typical, right? So that hasn't changed all that much. But this is what it looks like today. Lose me there. I'll come back yeah. here in a second if you lost me. Yeah, yeah, um, we we lost you. We, you're, right. ba you're back. You're back. Okay, cool. So these are the some of the things that I'm seeing. That's Igniter Four. Mm -hmm. So if you ask me why is this happening here, well, it's because all of this stuff is part of the Christian worldview, and and that's why I think we can explain why. But now I'm I listened to you tonight, and I'm going to add a couple of things here, because I'll I'll probably morph this a little bit based on our conversation. Because I think you're absolutely right. There's something about the Christian worldview that says that we are created in the image of God, and that gives us the the free will reasoning powers that allow us to examine. Um, and, and actually, we think the Christian worldview encourages us to examine uh, natural theology. Let me let me back out for one second though, and just share one more thing with you. I'm going to stop sharing for a second, and and I'm, and I'm back. But because I want to be able to go in the back door. You know, one thing that bothers me about this whole discussion that sometimes atheists will throw at us, well, look, we know that Christianity is anti-science because you see the persecution of early scientific thinkers historically, and almost always they're going to point to folks like Galileo primarily. They could also, I suppose, point to Copernicus or to others. But what's interesting about that, so I that, you know, I'm not that I'm, write a book, I'm writing a book about that particular issue, but I think it's worth addressing. So I just want to share with you my thinking on this, and you tell me if we, you're on the same page with me. And so now I'm going to share a screen one more time. Sorry, this is my last time tonight, I promise. And uh, here it is. And so it's this claim right here that Christianity is anti-science. Can you see that now? I think you've got it up yep. there. Okay, so it's almost always grounded in the work of Galileo, right? Because here he is, this guy who's claiming that the universe, or that at least our solar system, is not geocentric, but is, is uh, heliocentric. And, and this is, you know, considered to be, well, the church, you know, uh, basically put them under a house arrest for these beliefs because they, they, they claim this was against what they believed uh, from Scripture. Well, if you think about that for a second, it's interesting. I don't think you can say that, that it was Christianity was anti-science, even in that moment, because we're really talking about the Roman Catholic authority. It would be fair to say, I think, well, the Roman Catholic authority didn't think that, that it was against Galileo in his, his heliocentric view of the, of the universe. Well, okay, I think it's fair if you want to make that claim, but that does not say much about whether Christianity is anti-science. It just says at this period of time that this Roman Catholic authority, but even then, I would have to ask the question, is that true? And here's why I say that, because it turns out that um, Galileo never stopped being a Catholic as a result of this, and he certainly didn't stop being a Christ follower. He often says things like this, the Bible shows the way to go to heaven, but not the way the heavens go. And what did he think was the way to go to heaven? He thought the way to go to heaven was through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. He never abandoned that view. He held that view, and even in the persecution he suffered by the church, he still died a Catholic and a, a, a Christ follower and a God believer. He said, whatever the course of our lives, we should receive them as the highest gift from the hand of God. He never changed his view on this. So he certainly did not see the same kind of conflict we often do. He saw no conflict between science and Christianity. As a matter of fact, he saw no conflict between science and Catholicism because he didn't abandon his scientific views and he didn't abandon his, his Catholicism. 
Now, what's interesting about that is that he's doing his work at a time when clearly all of the science leading up to this, with short of Copernicus, was geocentric. And that meant that he was dealing with the work of Aristotle as it was pretty much fleshed out by people like Ptolemy. So here he is. He, his argument is not with the church. His argument is with science. It's not in conflict with the church. His uh, argument is science in conflict with prior science. As a matter of fact, at the time he was doing his work, the church agreed with the science. They were holding on to that form of science. It was the scientific thinking of everyone who preceded him. So it's kind of hard to say that the church is against science when the church is actually agreeing. And not only that, every pope that followed this pope who was in conflict with Galileo, and by the way, a lot of Galileo's problem was that Galileo had a personality that was pretty abrasive, okay? Copernicus did not suffer the same fate of Galileo. The difference, a lot of it is, well, Copernicus died toward the end of this, but Galileo was a bit of a jerk. He was a bit, not a jerk, but kind of like a prideful. <laughs> Let's put it that way. The church, though, supports all of this. It's been said that, that, that the medieval period gave birth, and it did, it gave birth to the university. And by the way, the university was entirely supported by the, the papacy. And about 30% of what happened there was what's called natural philosophy, which was basically the sciences. So what was happening in those universities, supported by the papacy, was science. And between this period and the Dark Ages, more Europeans had access to a scientific education than in any prior culture. And why is that? Because the papacy actually supported it. The Roman Catholic Church gave more financial and social support to the study of astronomy, for example, over six centuries than anyone else, probably than all other institutions combined. And why? Because they had a vested interest. They were trying to set the liturgical calendar, most of which was set, by the way, of, of, of finding, you know, picking out Easter based on the moon. So they had good reasons to support uh, astronomy. Um, for during that time. So a lot of that was we could argue was selfish, but my whole point is it doesn't matter if it's selfish. So so I think that that when people say this, you know, those kinds of claims that we would be uh, 1500 years ahead if it hadn't been for the church dragging science back by its coattails, that that to me drives me nuts when I see that and that really comes from Catherine Farringer who I think first quoted this. But if we start talking about what science is, it turns out that science, as we know it today, is largely born and birthed by Christians. So, so I mean, if nothing else, I'm going to stop sharing there for a second. So if nothing else, I think you'd have to say, just based on the sheer number of Christians who lead the scientific revolution, I'll just say one last thing about this. So I didn't just do the work. You know, what I'm trying to—the the next book is a book that basically makes the case that you could— uh, make a case for the historicity and deity of Christ if there was no New Testament. So if you said, I don't trust the New Testament for what it tells me about Jesus, fine, get rid of it. You would know everything you need to know about Jesus from all the other stuff. And one of those areas you would know from is education and science. And here's why I say that. We often hear it said that you can only trust what scientists tell you. They are the arbiter of truth. And I would rather trust a science. Look, don't you hear that right now in this the COVID-19 thing? It's like, hey, unless the president has a bunch of scientists on the stage, people want to hear what the science has to say about this. I get it. I get it. Okay. So it turns out, if you look at the science fathers, the, the people who started every single scientific discipline, well, it turns out those guys, there's about 160 of them, those guys also wrote more than just science journals. They often wrote about Jesus of Nazareth. If you just go back and find those writings and start to list all of the attributes of Jesus that are mentioned by the science fathers, you will actually find out that they actually they say the same thing that the church fathers say. So if you're saying, I can only trust what the leading scientists, and by the way, it's not just that they're the fathers of these disciplines. I went back and looked at what medals have been assigned to these. Do you know how many Nobel, I think like 60% of Nobel laureates in the sciences at the last count are Christian. This is happening even today. So if you're saying, I can only trust what science tells me, do you trust what the scientists would tell you about Jesus? Because it turns out the science fathers will give you the most robust picture of Jesus, including his teaching, including all the parables, every miracle, every attribute of Jesus, including the resurrection, including all of that stuff. It's not like those scientists had a problem, right, uh, doing science and also simultaneously believing that God could enter into the human race and uh, rise from the grave. They accepted those two things. They didn't see a contradiction between those two things. 
So I think that to me helps me to, to at least kind of overcome this notion that that Christianity is anti-science. Now, I think what they, most people mean when they say that, David, is they mean they've met a Christian in their lifetime who seemed to be resistant to the science. That is probably true. And that's why I think we in this generation have to start to rethink and understand our place historically in the sciences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, let me see what you have. Uh, <laughs> um, Richard says uh, Galileo called uh, called the Pope simpleton. Yeah. Then yeah. Urban turned on him and had him uh, inquisited. Um, heliocentrism was just an excuse. Yeah, if you actually look into the uh, uh, Galileo thought he had it made because his, the Pope was his friend, right? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, someone who was his friend actually took over. And uh, he put forward his book and he brought it to the Pope and said, hey, you know, I got this book. Uh, on you know these competing worldviews and stuff, I'd like to uh, I'd like to put I'd like to put this book out there, and the Pope said, "Fine, no problem." He said, "I just want you to include one thing in there, just include one thing," because the Pope actually had a different position. What's what's strange here is the Pope was right. The Pope's view was the Pope's view was that if you have two competing hypotheses, there could be a third hypothesis that accounts for the data even better than both. Right. So you need to be kind of kind of tentative here and yeah, say open handed. But there, yeah, yeah. There could be yeah. another there could be another explanation. So I don't want to put I don't want to put my foot down here. So he said, could you just include that in your book? That when it comes to That's ultimate right. causes, there could be another cause that we're that we're not even familiar with. And it's right because Galileo's defending the Copernican model, which is actually wrong. That's right. This is actually wrong. Right. That's right. Um, it was it was better than it was better than the geocentric model, but it was still wrong. And so yep. the Pope was actually the one who was right. Anyway, Galileo turns out had made an agreement years earlier when there were some pro there there were some pro there were some problems with his teaching, and it was brought forward. Hey, can can you show us? Can you show us that the Earth is spinning and moving the way you say it is? Just give a, give a, give us any evidence. And he couldn't. And then they, so the, it was okay. Then stop teaching it. Sign this contract. Say you're not you're not teaching that because you can't show that this is actually the case. Right. Because guys. We're all from a time when we take this stuff for granted. Keep in mind, if you're talking about, if you're talking about centuries ago, and you say, "Hey, guy, hey guys, you know we're spinning at a thousand miles an hour right now, and we're we're hurtling through space much faster than that." Did you know that? I mean, that sounds insane. That sounds completely yeah, yeah, right. insane and idiotic. You sound like a crazy person. So when people started putting forward these views, and you had people in the church on both sides. Uh, it was, okay, could you just give us some evidence for that? Give us some sort of evidence for that. And just saying, hey, this fits the, you know, the, the equations of models right. a little a little bit better is not enough to overcome the level of absurdity. And so they were put, they were, they, they, uh, they, they put all this before Galileo said, hey, can you prove what you're saying? He couldn't. And e even the guy who was, who was, who was, uh, who was there that he signed the contract with saying he would stop teaching. Until until he could actually prove something, the guy said yes. If if he could ever prove it, then we're in a different ballgame. But right now right, he can't right. show anything, right? So he had right. Galileo had signed a contract saying he won't teach it. Then later on, his friend became pope, and he said, "Great, now I've got I've got the pope in my pocket." So he goes to the pope and says, uh, "Hey, uh, you mind if I teach this book? I mean, you mind if I publish this book?" Pope says, "Yeah, sure, great. Just include that one little idea." So what happened was. Galileo didn't bother to mention to the Pope that I'd already signed an agreement that I would not teach this. And two, he did put that quotation in. It was just almost a direct quotation from the Pope about not knowing ultimate causes. And so we, we just have to be humble and understand that we don't right. know these things. Uh, he put them on the mouth. This, this whole thing's a, a, a dialogue. And he put those words in the mouth of the idiot named Simpli Simplicio was called the he's, which means simpleton, right? Simpleton. Yeah. yeah. He puts mm -hmm. it. He puts the Pope's words in the mouth of the simpleton. So the Pope, who had given his blessing to the whole work, says, "Wait a minute. He didn't tell me anything about this contract that he signed, and he makes me look like a moron in this thing. Uh, and it's 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 following the Protestant Reformation when everyone's freaking out about how we keep people." Uh, under control and from thinking they can come up with their own interpretations of scripture. And Galileo's going around, I don't need you guys. I don't need you theologians. I don't have right, to listen right. to this. I don't have to listen to this guy. I can figure all this stuff out myself. And so there was a call for the crackdown on on Galileo. He had the Jesuits who were backing him up. He had others who were against him. And at the end of the day, he was found guilty of, of breaking his contract, of breaking this contract that he'd agreed to. And his ultimate sentence was house arrest. And so the the, yes. the ultimate example of this eternal warfare between church and science 
is that a man who insulted the Pope, violated a contract, ticked everyone off because he was the best trash talker of his time, uh, got put on house arrest. And that's, yes, that's, and, that's, and that's the house arrest example. he was put on it was, was actually qu quite exquisite. So he still had strings he could pull mm -hmm. to, to be able to, to kind of pick a spot that was really quite comfortable. Yeah, it's, he's an interesting character. Yeah. But I just think that, that, that if, if you didn't even know, yeah. though, anything about Galileo, if you just were even willing to concede, okay, yeah, if I don't know anything about the Galileo experience, but it, it sure looks like the Pope spanked Galileo. Okay, fine. That still does not explain why we have an explosion of Christians at the formation of every scientific discipline and leading the scientific revolution. I just don't know how you explain that if there's not something innate about their view that allows them, as some have said, to think God's thought after him. And, and that is what I think you see that, that happening. Uh, but I just think that's interesting. That's why I wanted to ask you tonight why that doesn't happen on the other side for other groups. Yeah. Right. I think the same thing can be said about education. There are some things about education that seem to be um, that, that kind of flow out of of the uh, they flow out of a Christian worldview. And, and because that's a piece of this, it's not just that we have an inclination to do science. Is that we are then responsible for establishing the institution. Here's another kind of crazy thing. If you look at the top 10, um, the top, if all you had were the top, you, you're a student looking to go to college and you're like, oh, what are the top 50 universities in America and in the world today? Uh, well, what are the top 10 universities in the world today? Well, they are all founded by Christians, the entire, all the top 10. The vast majority of the top 50 are all founded by Christians. Now, it doesn't mean they're, they're Christian universities now. But if you were to go to those campuses for a campus visit and you said, hey, I want to just look at the campus. And you thought, well, you know, while I'm here, can I just check the charter to see what the what, why was the school founded? It turns out you'd be able to reconstruct the entire story of Jesus just from the buildings on those campuses, because those buildings have etchings, paintings, windows and murals and all kinds of things uh, that describe the life of Jesus. You're not going to get away from Christianity because because a high education, as we know it today, has its roots in the Christian worldview. To me, that's just so fascinating because why? Why? You know, Buddha precedes Jesus. Zoroaster precedes Jesus. Krishna. Why don't these characters, these these uh, um, figures in history, have the kind of impact that Jesus does? That's the I think the question that everyone should ask. Not only that. As you know, all of those worldviews accommodate Jesus in one way or another. They'll either mention Jesus specifically by name, or there's a place within their theological construct where Jesus fits nicely. This is not true in Christianity for the other uh, religious worldview leaders. They don't fit within Christianity. So if you're a Baha'i, well, Jesus fits in as a manifestation of God. But there's no place for Baha'u'llah within Christianity. That's interesting to me. That's why I think in the end, you should start with Christianity before you start looking at anything else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I just think it's really, I mean, imagine the level of bias where you've got the entire scientific revolution. And so for, for, for people who don't, who don't normally study these things, the scientific revolution is roughly the period from, uh, from Copernicus to Isaac Newton, because and then Isaac Newton comes up with the unification of theories. And now he's, he's figured out the, he's basically figured out the rough picture of the entire universe. And so basically physics is, is under control. And then you, you know, you start, you, you end up having all these other uh, explosions in knowledge uh, as well, but you've, you've got, you, you've got that, that, that's the rough period. And as we pointed out, all these guys are Christians of, of one variety of another. They're very frequently funded in their research by the church. They're all in Christian countries, but they're 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 in different country, Christian countries. Some of them are Protestant, some of them are Catholic, yeah, and so on. That's right. And so it's it's basically it's it's just exploding out of Christianity. Just imagine. I mean, you're pointing out all these guys, all these pioneers, all these these fathers of all these different fields. These guys are. It's it's you see this list of Christians. And you can actually you, you can actually talk to modern atheists who've never studied any of this. They actually think these guys were undercover closet atheists who were just scared of getting persecuted. Right. Absolute, right. absolute, absolute nonsense. Notice the problems here. Right. One, one, um, 
you didn't have to be Christian in other parts of the world, and other parts of the world didn't figure this stuff out. So it's only in the it's only in the right. it's only in the, the the Christian area of the world. Uh, That's right. Two, even if you, we don't just have their public writings, we have their private writings. That's right. We have their letters to their family. We know what these guys believe, and they were many of them were very very devout Christians whose whose entire yep. research project was viewed as worship of the Almighty. And so just imagine where you would look at this, right? Because this is how, you know, Richard Dawkins and so on, I've, I've, I've watched his talks. This is how they look at it, right? They look at that. They, they look at that history. And if all you zero in on is Galileo, and even that you can't get right, and you just have to portray it as he came out, he came up with some scientific evidence, and the church just went ballistic and and locked him up, and and they'll actually put up pictures with him in like like chains and stuff yeah, like that yeah, in a yeah, dungeon. Yeah. It's total nonsense, yeah. right? So yeah. they have they so they go to one story to show this this eternal conflict, um, and then they have to to make up like ninety eight percent of that story, and it, you know it. What, what's amazing is that these are the guys that are proclaiming themselves to be the champions of reason and rationality and evidence. Yes. And they're the they're some of the most biased people who've ever walked the planet. They can't even look and say, wow, what was it about this worldview and about these guys that made them go out there and discover that? It's no, hey, there's a there's a conflict with, with Galileo. Let's ignore, you know, 98% of the actual reality and the details. Just zero in on this fact that it's the church versus right. this guy and make that... Make that the entire story of the relationship between Christianity and and science. And it's just, wait, you guys are the ones claiming to be the champions of reason right. and rationality here. And we're the ones, we're the ones you can't trust here, right? You're you're the open minded well, ones just going where the evidence points and we're the biased ones. Right. Yeah. I know. Well, I'll tell you what, I, this is something I discovered when I was doing this work, right? We I wanted to collect a, the most robust. I, years ago I had assembled a list that was largely just off, you know, kind of online resources and just a very cursory list of of, of scientists who had done a meaningful work who held a Christian worldview. Okay, very short list. Well, so I started to think, okay, now I want to get the most robust list ever assembled. Well, there's not like a printed, there's not like a, a, a book that anyone has written that has assembled this list. And so how do I assemble it? Well, we're going to start by just using online resources and see where that points us. If, they, if it points us by way of bibliography to a book resource, then we'll get it. And we'll just assemble this ourselves from scratch. Well, one of the things you'll do is look at the online resources. Trust me, the Christianity has been scrubbed out of every bio of these historic scientists. You wouldn't know from the stuff you find online that these folks had a robust Christian worldview, even though they may have written theological works in addition to scientific works. They might have been a, uh, a pastor they, uh, you know, or, or served at their church. In addition, by the way, it's not just that, you know, the, the, the earliest science uh, associations, royal academies, the, the different, and, and wherever they have popped up, if it's in England, in Italy, in, in France, in Germany, they are founded by Christians and populated by Christians and by a large number of, of Catholics. And you'll see that the, the, even the, 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 the academies, the uh, associations that we, we revere today, which may be very different today, but just remember that they were started by Christians. Now, to be honest, the list I put together, it doesn't like slow down in the 21st century. It's not like, okay, I, I, I can go back and I can find X number in the 9th century, X number in the 10th century. I did it for every century. So I get to the 18th, the 19th, and 20th centuries, and now I'm in the 21st century, right? Oh, well, the 20th century, the last entire 100-year block, it's not like the number of, of, of thinkers and scientists who are award Copley medals. Uh, no, I mean, I don't care what uh, medal you can think of in the science. that They're winners of these medals. These are leaders in their fields. It doesn't slow down in the 20th century, and it's not slowing down in the first 20 years of this century. So I look at that, I think, okay, I mean, regardless of what you think has happened historically, it's not as though we are not represent. We are overrepresented. Now you can say, well, yeah, well, that's because there are so many Christians in the world. Well, okay, but the idea was here was that you just told me that Christianity is anti-science, so it should be based on that anti-science bias that I would expect them to be underrepresented when it comes. And it turns out they're overrepresented. That to me is interesting. Why is that the case?
Mm -hmm. I mean, I just want to be able to explain it. I don't think I have to explain it. I think I can just show it. A lot of times when I'm working on a case in front of a jury, I cannot tell you how he killed her. Because he did it, you know, and no one even looked, looked for her for 10 years. So by the time I'm working the case, there's no body. And, and I can't tell you how he got rid of her body or what room he killed her in because I didn't even start investigating it. No one even visited the house for the first five years. But I can demonstrate that he did it. Mm -hmm. And I tell the jury, you're just going to have to, how he did it, unless he confesses to this, we're never going to know. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that he did it. Now, why this is happening that's interesting to me, but there can be no mistaking that it's happening, that mm -hmm. Christians are overrepresented in the sciences. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is an interesting fact that we have to at least bend our knee to that, because that's just a matter of the collection of data. That's, I'm not making an inference to try to explain the data. I'm simply gathering the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, uh, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you know, science is... Once people know that the universe is intelligible and that we are the kinds of things that can figure it out and they just accept the idea that it's good, anyone can do science, even if it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's not something that would come out of their worldview or some, not something that would flow out of their worldview. Like, I don't know how you would, if you were an atheist and you were at the time of Copernicus, I can't imagine you doing what Copernicus did or doing or, or playing any role in the scientific revolution, your your worldview just would not have led you to think that you could go out there and figure that stuff out. Whereas now atheists have absorbed all of the ideas, not realizing that none of these make any sense uh, on atheism. Um, so now everyone, of, of course, everyone can can do science in the world now, but there's only there's only there's only one group I'm aware of where it could actually get off the ground in in any sense that remotely resembles a revolution. Um, any other group in the world, whether it's India, uh, India, China, India, China, uh, Africa, uh, any of these places um, could come up with certain scientific developments. They could figure out how to how to do stuff. They could figure out, um, you know, they could figure, you know, they could do astronomy and things like that. But as far as something that produces a a revolution, uh, that 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 came from that came from one place, ladies and gentlemen, one place. Um, all right, Jay, I think I lost you there. Jay, you still around? Yo, you there? Check, check, check. I lost Jay Warner Wallace for a minute. Let me talk about, <laughs> let me take a comment real quick and maybe we can get Jay back. But check out this comment because this is one of the saddest things I've ever seen in my entire life. Talk about an inferiority complex. Talk about an inferiority complex here. Um, this is from Money Talks, who is our Muslim friend. And Money Talks said, really, Muslims provided toothpaste, cameras, coffee, algebra, modern cryptology, university, calligraphy, combination locks. I could go on, but the chat limits me. You could, you could go on. You could go on Money Talks. It'd be very interesting if you could go on, uh, but when you go on, are you going to go on with a bunch of nonsense or are you gonna actually tell the truth? Um, let, let me tell you how these things work, ladies and gentlemen. So Muslims will, especially during that period that we already talked about earlier in the program, you have a period where Islam will take over an area and then will have a, a brief flourishing that will eventually be suffocated by Islam. And things will flourish for a while. And then here we are, you know, a thousand years later, and when you ask, when you ask Muslims, hey, you know what is Islam doing for the world? They'll, they'll have to go back a thousand years to find something. During some period when Islam conquered an area, took some of the, took some of the things in that area, uh, used them, put, the, put them to some use. And oh, let me get off here put them to some use, and then um, after putting them to some use, uh, it's eventually suffocated. But they always, always, always have to exaggerate. Cameras, Muslims, Islam produced cameras. Muslims produced cameras. Are you, are you joking? You guys know where this come from? You guys know where this comes from? That uh, Here, let me get, uh, let me see if I get Jay back on. If not, we'll just roll on. Hey, Jay. Hey, sorry. I lost, lost you for you a second. There. Yep, no I problem. think it's nope. my, no, it was it, on my it, side. It, it, trust me, I've been doing this for a while. It happens. 
Okay. Technolo cool. Technology cool. is not perfect, especially during a, uh, especially pandemic. during a yeah pandemic when every, <laughs> everyone is on the internet. Everyone has internet problems. It happens. Well, you know, I listened to your answer though to that too, which you were yeah. talking about, and what I thought was the first thing I heard when you said that was yeah, that's true. I mean, that's a, you have to go back mm -hmm. to that period I showed you. So the, the, the vast majority of any innovation that I see from scientists is in that period I showed you the bump, okay? But it's not as though in that same period that there weren't other people doing clocks, for example, mm -hmm. doing algebra. I'll yeah. tell you that the representation of Islam yeah. online, for example, in mm -hmm. terms of its numbers of sheer scientists is large. Because there's a certain sense that they want to they want to represent Islam online in this way. It's not like there's a, a bias against Islam in terms of the, the the stuff that's online, in terms of a list. If you had a list, for example, of key scientists in the history of science, uh, the online sources will overrepresent Islam. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they will have no make no effort to wash out their religious thinking, to, to kind of erase out the fact that these were Muslims. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you're a Christian on that list, there's a good chance they're going to try to erase your Christian uh, foundation and, and it, not even mention it. So, But what you're seeing is exactly what you're seeing. I'm not suggesting that there's no Muslim innovation in the sciences. Yeah. The problem is it's all rooted in the Middle Ages, yeah. and it doesn't seem to continue beyond that. Yeah, and, and we, we you, you, you literally began your presentation talking about that, right? We ended up discussing yeah. that, that you had uh, in astronomy, in uh, engineering we talked about, in medicine, yes. in, and medicine science, yeah, in yeah. mathematics. Yeah. And so we talked about that. But, but guys, here's what happened. Uh, I, will, uh, I, I will actually grant, I will actually grant coffee. Right. Because that, as far as I recall, we, we could always do a little research. As far as I recall, it was a Sufi Muslim in an area of Yemen where they had these beans and he started soaking them in some water. And he realized, hey, I feel good after after drinking this. Um, how you would conclude <laughs> that that is a development of, you know, something to do with Islam. You'd have to attribute everything that was in every area that, oh, you know, someone ate berries or someone ate, you know, a uh, kind of nut or something like that. You, you'd have yes. to say all these people are, are it's because of their it's because of their religious uh, identity or something like that. The uh, yeah. most of the rest of this stuff is so idiotic and nonsensical. Cameras? You didn't invent cameras. You, you know what the argument here is? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you've studied this, but I, I've, I've actually I I've actually seen the video. The the it, it, this was a, a popular video about a uh, it was it was actually it was actually put out by like the discovery uh, uh, dis, discover the discovery channel or something like that and they had this museum exhibit a thousand and one inventions uh, and uh, and the history of Islam or something like uh, and the chamber of you know something the chamber of secrets that had a, it had this catchy title right yeah so um they actually uh, they went in there <laughs> you go into this you go into this exhibit. And uh, you, you watch this. Kids watch this video. It's for kids. Kids go on field trips and find out how Islam produced all these things. And you watch these videos. And uh, basically all these Muslims from the past are coming along and they're seeing all of modern science. And they're uh, they're taking credit for it. Right. So one of them sees someone's pulls out a camera phone and he looks at it and he goes, I knew it was an idea when I came up with the idea for the for the camera, blah, 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 blah. Right. And you actually look up the guy. You look up the guy and. The, the camera obscura, the idea that you can have a box and you can have a, you know, a box. And so that, that was known by Aristotle, right? That's, that, that's right. in the writings of Aristotle that you could have that sort of thing. Well, what this guy did and his big claim to fame was he said that the eye is actually like this, the camera obscura, this, this idea that you can have a box and, you know, go through a pinhole and actually get an image on the back of it. Right. They knew about right. that long before this guy, he said, I believe the eye is like that. So that's what he did. And yet... <laughs> He gets portrayed in museum exhibits for kids as the guy who invented the camera. And it's total nonsense. Right. And then you have guys like Money Talks here who say, oh, we invented the camera, right? Uh, what else? Algebra. God, dude, the Babylonians did algebra long before, long before Muslims existed. Right. The Greeks, the Egyptians, the Indians, they all did algebra. What did what did Muslims do? Well, Muslims, when they took over areas that had algebra, yeah, they tweaked it. Yeah, they, they made some progress. But here's, yes. what, here's what I do not understand. Jay, I, I, I'm saying this because I see it over and over and over and yes, over again, yes. right? If if someone did something, you could very reasonably say, you know what? We made some developments in algebra. Yeah. It There was algebra, and we made some things we better. Mm -hmm. We made it better. Sure. sure. And sure. algebra is named after a Muslim guy, al Jabr. And so, you know, it, he, he was so cool. People named it after yes. him. Why? Because the Europeans thought of it as associated with this guy, right? Uh, so... 
I don't see why they can't just say they it has to we yeah. invented that. Uh what well, one Muslim guy, one Muslim guy compared the eye to a camera obscura, which was known which was known a thousand years earlier by Aristotle. Right. Therefore, we claim to invent the camera. Why? It's the same thing. You go all the way back through Islam. It, it doesn't matter. It, 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 everything has to come from Islam and they have to exaggerate yes. everything. Dude, we understand that you have a kind of inferiority complex, right? We understand that, but don't don't make stuff up in order to respond to it. Try to account for why and try to fix it. That's, that, that's all I would say. Try to figure out why right. you, you guys were behind. Try to figure out why, especially especially if you want to blame it on something else. If you want to say, no, it actually wasn't Islam that, that suffocated scientific knowledge and reasoning. It was something else. It was some other factor. We'll, we'll explain that. I'd be happy to hear that. But, but dude, don't, 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 don't go along with all this nonsense. All right, Jay. And what, and what you can do, too, is you can simply be realistic and honest about what the claim actually is. If you wanted to say, well, we have the father uh, whose name, we have the father of the name of algebra, mm -hmm. fine. Cool. But you can't you can't really say you, you've invented algebra because that actually occurs long before either Jesus or uh, Muhammad are on the planet. And if you want the father of modern algebra, just Google it. Mm -hmm. That's a Roman. That's a Catholic named Francois Viette. Uh, that's in the 1540 to 1603. So now, if you, now you could there's going to be a father for the uh, introduction of algebra there'll be somebody who gets to put his name on it that might be the guy in the middle there and, and from islam but if you're looking for modern algebra the way that you and i studied it because most of the time when we say the father of algebra we're all thinking really like i studied algebra in high school no 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 the kind of thing you study now in high school that's not that's going to be a, a, a catholic guy named francois viette Okay, so I get it. I get it that we have this desire to put labels on people, and I don't want to over-label our side either. But I think just be honest about it. Probably where you're in the middle, you, you've tweaked something, like you, like you said, David, and then you get credit for naming it. Fine. But, but if you want the, the, the guy who's the father of algebra the way that you and I are doing it, that turns up to be somebody in the scientific revolution, right, in the first century of the scientific revolution, and he happened to be a Catholic. Yeah, and uh, I mean— I, I... <laughs> Go what are you going to do? I mean, look, I can yeah. go through all this because we started collecting these names and it started to stand out to me. I wasn't trying to search for the fathers of these disciplines, but I was struck immediately by how many were. And then once you get to a point right around the 16th century where scientists start saying, well, that dude's really good. He deserves an award. And we start giving medals and awards to people for their brilliant work in the sciences. Well, now you're going to see another group of, of Christians that dominate that race as well. So I've got a list also of all the medal winners in all of these centuries. And I'll just tell you that if you look at that stuff, I get it. I'm not going to try to even explain it. I do think a Christian worldview explains it. Don't get me wrong. But if I wasn't even going to try to do that, I, I could not deny that these folks existed and made that kind of impact on the sciences. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I agree, I, I up front start off by saying to you, I think that there's a, a you have to explain the jump in, in because it appears that even from a theological perspective, that Islam was prepared to take over cultures and adopt, at least initially, their research, their philosophy, this used to be called the natural philosophy, the term science is a relatively recent term. Uh, originally in the first uh, centuries and the, through the Middle Ages, this is called the natural philosophies uh, of nature. And you'll see that there is a, a, a burst of this within Islam. But it appears that they were able to, like you said, they, their theology allowed them to come in and capitalize on the work of others and advance it to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. But at some point, the theology that said you, you must bend your knee to the, uh, the, the to the teaching of the Quran seems to have won the day, and it seems to stop. Mm -hmm. And it does. And now Muslims are forced to, you know, say, well, you know, 500 years ago or a thousand years ago, we did this little thing real, you know, right here. But guess what? Muslims, anyone can do that. Anyone can do that in the world. One group can take credit for the scientific revolution. And as far as we can tell, it flows out of a it flows out of a particular worldview. We have a we have a battle in the chat. Uh, we'll, we should probably be closing out. We've been going for two yes, hours. Yes, but, um, yes, we had yes, a good. we had a battle in the chat over coffee because I was willing to grant them coffee. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I, I'm going to say something provocative here. I apologize for it. If if all we got out of that entire movement was coffee, I, it, it would probably be justified from my perspective, okay? Oh, yeah, because yeah. that is something that has more, probably more value 
better than any science. I, I hate to say that, but I'm not as as as, as uh, interested in astronomy as I am in coffee. We'd be we'd be okay? we'd be we'd be on pretty uh, pretty close pages, uh, uh, yeah, pretty yeah, similar pages yeah. there. And I will say that would that would be my 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 favorite thing to ever definitely ever come yes, out of uh, yes, Islam. Definitely. Uh, but uh, let let me just read here from the history. Okay. The earliest credible evidence of coffee drinking as the modern beverage appears in modern day Yemen in southern Arabia in the middle of the 15th century in Sufi shrines. So I actually, I think I got that part right. It was in what is now Yemen that coffee seeds were first roasted and brewed in a manner similar to how it is now prepared for drinking. But the coffee seeds, and this is where the, dis where the dispute uh, comes in, but the coffee seeds had to be first exported from East Africa to Yemen uh, as coffee is indigenous to uh, Ethiopia. The Yemenis obtained the coffee via Somali traders who in turn procured the beans from the Ethiopian highlands and began to cultivate the seed. By the 16th century, the drink had reached the rest of the Middle East and North Africa. From there, it spread to Europe and the rest of the world. So here's apparently the transition. Ethiopians were using the beans, but uh, Sufis in Yemen came up with the method of roasting them uh, to to get the, uh, the the sort of good coffee taste out of them. So uh, money talks. You couldn't even get that one right. All right. So, but I'll, I'll, I'll grant it to you, man. I'm trying to be I'm trying to be charitable. Just don't take credit for algebra and all and all this other stuff. All right. But Jay, we've been uh, we've been going for uh, two hours straight. Again, I remind everyone you got the links the to got the links to uh, Jay's website, to a couple of his books, and to his YouTube channel all in the description box. Be sure you uh, uh, subscribe to his channel and check out his site and, and check out his uh, his resources. You can tell he's a smart guy who loves to do his research. And so uh, you're going to get a lot of stuff that's not covered um, anywhere else. All right, Jay, any uh, final thoughts for anyone? Dude, I'm surprised that our internet connection held up this long. So if you can still hear me, thank you, David. I, I, I want to do it again, though, at some point, because I feel like there's a couple of areas that I'd also like to talk about that that I wonder if Islam has made the kind of contribution that Christianity has also. And, and just the arts. I hate to, to kind of give it away. No. But that's an area no. I don't think they have. And obviously there's theological reasons why they might not. But I think that's something that's worth talking about, both in music, literature, and in um, art. Let's mm -hmm. sometimes get back together and do that one, too. Yeah, uh, basically, uh, especially during coronavirus lockdown, when, you know, I'm, I'm around every <laughs> pretty much every night. Anytime, yeah, no, I'd love and, to do it again. I'm ready to talk about it whenever and, you want. Just, and, just, just, let's just connect and do it. Any Anytime you got something you want to talk about, something you've studied in the past, something you're working on for the future, anytime you got something. Topic, yep. uh, just give me give me two or three days notice and stuff and say yeah i will talk about this and we're good thanks brother you're the all best right. i appreciate you all, all right, right man. Uh, thanks again i appreciate it all right catch everyone later and right. i'll have more stuff for everyone coming out tomorrow